Order, order. Hello everyone, I, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the second oral evidence session of the British Youth Council conducting an inquiry into votes at 16. My name is Michael Hope and I am the chair of the Youth Select Committee. Over recent years, the debate regarding votes at 16 has been reignited uh, due to its reduction for the referendum on Scottish independence. The purpose of this select committee is to review both sides of the argument for and against votes at 16 and to assess additional yet equally crucial factors such as youth political engagement, political parties' views on young people and citizenship education. A particular warm welcome to our first set of witnesses. Please can we begin with Kyle if you could introduce yourself and explain which organisation you represent. I'm Kyle Thornton, I'm Chair of the Scottish Youth Parliament uh, and I suppose I should declare at this point I'm also the British Youth Council's Vice Chair for Finance as well, uh, so I've got a bit of experience in the field. Thank you. David? If you could just introduce yourself. Uh, I'm, I'm David Langridge, I'm the Chair of the Reading Youth Cabinet. Um, yeah. um, I'm Ellie Emerson, I'm the Member of Youth Parliament for Reading and um, a member of the Reading Youth Cabinet. Hello, I'm Peggy Milana and I'm a member of Barnsley Youth Council and a member of British uh, member of uh, British Youth Council. I'm Daisy, I'm the Youth Mayor of Oldham and I am a retired member of Youth Parliament. Thank you very much. I'll pass you on to Joel for our first question. Just to ask you all, why did you decide to stand for election? And we can start with Kyle. Absolutely. Well, I suppose I mean, I'm also a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament for Glasgow Southside, and I'm elected to that by general election. I suppose I personally stood for election because I wanted to you know, be a voice in my community. You know, I felt that I could give you know, something to the young people, you know, of my area to represent them. My kind of part of Glasgow has got a real kind of mixed community, and actually, you know, I felt I could really, you know, add my voice. I think personally, it's also something that. I was interested in, but I would say that one of the reasons I got involved was really good youth work. It was that strong kind of youth work, what we now call youth voice provision that there was, which encouraged me, you know, through local youth forums, through different kind of means to get involved and, you know, to kind of take interest. I know from our members of the Scottish Youth Parliament more generally, they have a, a similar experience and that they get involved because they want to benefit their community, they get involved because they want to change something, maybe a specific issue, maybe society in general, you know, people get involved for lots of different reasons, but a lot of it is very much to help others, it's a positive aspect, and it's a bit about, you know, they think they can help others, but they also think that they would enjoy and that they would be really good at the job, uh, and I think the vast majority of our members, you know, are really good at that. Thank you. Um, I've always personally been quite interested in sort of politics and current affairs, and I thought that, um, a bit like Carl, I could do something for the people in my area by, by sort of trying to... Um, to help give them a, a bit more of a, a voice, because I know with young people, often they don't have the chance to be heard, um, and a lot of the time, you know, their, their issues aren't looked at with as much, you know, focus. So, I I felt like um, trying to do something to help, yeah, the people in my area. Thank you. Um, so I attended um, an event in 2011, which was held by um, my Reading Youth Cabinet. And um, they kind of said that they were having elections and I just kind of thought I'd go for it. And um, one of their campaigns is mental health, so I got quite involved in that. Um, the reason I stood for Member of Youth Parliament is because I'm really passionate about curriculum for life and votes at 16. Um, and I think in Reading it's quite driven, those campaigns are really driven. And I just, as well as like these two have said, in my community I really felt I could make a difference. Thank you. Uh, I would probably say uh, my involvement was due to the fact that I felt uh, young people in my er area was extremely unre unrepresented. The way that um, uh, we, we were not included in the decision making and it started in 2009 where I felt like some se serious actions really needed to occur because uh, our electorates were, were not including young people in, in their manifesto and therefore we had to find an alternative to get our voices heard and I think uh, Boundary Youth Council and uh, UK Youth Parliament really gave me the opportunity to represent my people. Thank you. Um, I got involved in a minute. <coughs> Sorry. I got involved on my youth council through a community cohesion trip um, and then I got involved further after that because I wanted to build confidence and I thought oh, it'll look good on my CV. But then when you get involved and you realise what it's more about and you think, God, my community really does need some 
youth voice and then I joined the youth parliament and yeah, just to let Oldham's voice be heard. Right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll pass you on to 390 who has the next question. Um, so from what you've seen, do you think that 16 year olds are capable of being engaged in the processes of democracy and why do you think that? So should we start with Kyle? Absolutely, I think 16 year olds are absolutely able in terms of having the right to vote and I think in terms of, I would differ between the right to vote and engaging in democracy. I think someone of any age can engage in democracy. In general I've seen 12, 13, 14, even younger kind of young people who are interested, who can engage, who can get a grasp of the issues. You know, so I think young people you know, are absolutely able to engage with it. The problem is democracy just isn't very good at trying to engage with young people. You know, the, the party spinning, the, you know, the, the, the Westminster politics, all of that, it just puts young people right off. And, you know, they don't talk about young people's issues. You know, the, the role of the grey vote is really quite clear in UK and I think to an extent Scottish politics in terms of where policy is directed. So I think that puts off young people. In terms of the right to vote, uh, you know, I think 16 Central's absolutely could do it. I mean, for me, I always bring it down to one simple question, which is we say at 16 that you are, you know, by right able to raise a family, able to have children, and for me, I see that as very much one of the, you know, the most important things you can do in life. So this idea that you can't vote at that age, but you can raise a family, you know, it just doesn't add up for me. I think the right to vote is a logical one at 16. In Scotland in particular, most rights sit at the age of 16. Uh, you know, and I think for the campaign in general, you know, in the referendum, uh, Scottish independence, what we've seen is 16, 17 olds are some of the most vigorous participants in it. They're turning out to meetings. We've got registration at over 80%. You know, I go out to schools, you know, we go and do visits, and 16, 17 olds are right up there, hands up, asking the questions, getting stuck right into politicians, asking the questions, wanting to know, you know, what they see. So for me, you know, I don't just have the theoretical base of I think young people, if they got the right to vote, you know, would engage with it. What I'm seeing you know, from our experiences in Scotland today where they now have the right to vote in a couple of months' time is they've got that right to vote, they're taking it, they're engaging with democracy. It's, there's taken a lot of hard work to give young people that opportunity, but when you give young people that opportunity, that support, if you like, that ability to access the debate, they grasp it with both hands. Um, well, I personally don't know all 16 and 17 year olds. I'm sure that there are many people who are like capable of, um, of voting, but with a lot of the issues, um, people aren't very well informed about them. They're not given, like I was saying, there's a lot of spin in politics and there's a lot of um, um, trying to sort of pull the wool over people's eyes a bit. Um, I think what needs to happen is um, uh, a bit of a change in the way people are educated at school, maybe um, to, to help them to help them form sort of critical opinions of, of these issues and try and get them to engage in uh, democracy from, from a younger age, you know, before they leave school. And by the time they've left school, perhaps, you know, they'll be um, uh, sort of more, more willing to engage. And um, I mean, personally, from our own, from within Reading, we had a third, a third of the young people actually turned out to, to vote for the people on the, on the Reading Youth Cabinet. So, um, I mean, that, that shows that people are actively uh, bothering to vote um, for people who they think can, yeah, can make a change. I, guess. Um, I think young people are engaged in politics, but they're not directly involved because they don't have the vote. Um, I mean, us sat here is kind of the example that we are engaged in politics. It's just that we've not got the actual right to vote. Um, I would second what David said about um, there needs to be some form of education. We can't just give young people the vote. They need to be informed more so. I mean, a lot of young people are quite outraged about the exam reforms, and that's technically involved in politics, but they don't actually make the link or the connection between politics and education. They, they don't understand that it's the government making those decisions. So I think young people, if they're educated, then they will be directly involved. This is exactly right. Um, if we want to think about the definition of democracy, it's, it, it talks about empowering the people. But if you think about it, there are young people who are actually being discriminated against within the, our actual policies right now. The young people are not legally allowed to vote when, for example, they, they're allowed to have children. Therefore, th there is something that seems odd in our system, such as a passion of young people is quite eliminated 
to what we are allowed to do and what we are not allowed to do. For example, we might argue that 18-year-olds and 25-year-olds are the people who are the ones to be least voting at the general elections. But again, it goes back to the education. Who, if, if, if our um, curriculum for life is not compulsory in our schools, then how do we expect young people to know how important it is to decide who our decision makers are? So, in a way, we need to close the gaps by creating a curriculum for life and also Votes to 16, which fits perfectly with, with, with uh, British Youth Council's campaign on the both of them, which we are campaigning on for our year. So, for example, my region, we, um, Barnsley had the, the turnout of 39%, 0.79%, which was the fifth out of whole turnout of people, young people uh, voting, which was 8.9%. So that clearly shows that if young people try, they are really, they are really involved with politics. So it can, it can vary from your trip to school, that involves politics. If young people will be like, yeah, they are participating, but they are not legally putting a cross next to their preferring candidate, who will put their actual, include young people in their manifesto. So might as well give young people the opportunity to shine as the best they can be. Well, this proof that young people are engaged in politics from the success of Make Your Mark and the success in Oldham, like my area, we had 9,500 young people that voted, which is a 30% turnout, which is amazing. And that's with minimal, minimal budget, like word of mouth from like our youth workers and people in school. So it shows that young people can be engaged and can understand what is being said to them. Thank you. I know Pasha on to Theo. The next set of questions are about the engagement of young people in politics and current affairs. Why do you think that young people are less likely to vote um, in adult elections than older people? Bearing in mind, in some youth elections, such as the areas that you're from, the turnout is higher than the adult elections. Okay, yeah, Kyle, I'm, sorry. I'll have to go first, yeah. I mean, I think, like I said before, I think modern, I wouldn't call it adult politics, I would call it parliamentary politics, I think it just doesn't work for young people. I think what we've seen uh, in, you know, what we see in Westminster politics and you know, even Hollywood, it's a very divisive world. It's, it's off-putting, it's negative, you know, young people and I think, you know, in terms of youth voice type elections, they are much more positive. It's, it's candidates talking about what they will do, you know, not about how bad the other candidates are and I think that's that's such a radical departure from the way that politics is done in the mainstream. You know, I mean, you hear every day, you know, why the other side is so bad. You hear a bit less about why their side is so good. And I think, you know, we, in terms of kind of turnout and likely to vote, turnout is down across all age groups. It's not just young people. And I think that's a point that really has to be borne in mind is it's not young people that are voting with their feet and staying away from the ballot box. It's all generations. And I think it shows that politics in Britain has a long way to go to reconnect with voters. There's going to be, it will not be a quick fix, there will not be a quick solution to it, but I certainly think in relation to the kind of terms of this inquiry, that votes at 16 can be part of that. Uh, I see 16, 17 year olds, when you can get them at school in that captive audience stage, get people registered to vote into the way of voting, you can then you know, give them voting habits for life. But I think at the core of it, it's getting over to young people and to people in general why voting matters because the most common thing that I hear from people who aren't interested is well my vote doesn't you know mean anything and until we can give people a proper answer to that question which sadly I even myself struggle I'm, I vote in every election I'm one of those people who cannot help but vote when I have the opportunity but I think you know politics in general has to give an answer to that question you know, why should I bother to turn out and vote because unless you live in a marginal constituency in this country your vote you know what probably won't mean much and I say this as someone who comes from, you know, one of the safer areas for, you know, parties, you know, and I talk to young people across, you know, different areas of the country where, you know, when their vote doesn't matter, they really do question what exactly they're voting for. So would you mind repeating the question? Um, why do you think that young people are less likely to vote in adult elections than older people, bearing in mind the turnout for some youth elections is greater than the turnout for the same adult election. Okay. Um, well, I think obviously many of the issues that are looked at at Westminster, um, you know, they don't they don't take into account um, the the vote of young people because they're not writing policies for young people necessarily. Um, they're 
I, I think I think it's the, the the culture around the the kind of mainstream politics that we have in this country today um, that probably does deter some young people from from involving themselves in it. Um, I don't know. I don't. I'm not really sure. Um, I think there's several reasons. Um, I mean, we're doing a political consultation in Reading to kind of work out why young people wouldn't vote. And one of the things that's come up is that seven percent of pe young people we've done like um, questions so far don't know their MP or their local politician at all. And in my opinion, that's the politician's responsibility to be doing something about that. I think. I mean, the only reason I know who they are is because I'm directly involved. But my, none of my friends would like know who their local councillor or MP is, and I think it is down to the politician. But again, without the vote, in my opinion, politicians don't really need to consult with us. They don't need to discuss with us. Um, I've met politicians where they're not really interested in what I've got to say, or they kind of seem disengaged with me. And I think if I had the vote, they would definitely be listening a lot more. Uh, this exactly goes back to the Davis point. For example. Um, when we are 18 and we are legally currently allowed to vote, I, I doubt that there, there will be any point and anything in the manifesto that would appeal to me as a person who's just turned 18 and is, is looking forward for education and universities. For example, um, w um, what, is the, what is the chance of uh, them inc to include anything to do with tuition fees or etc. because if, if we have reduced the voting age to 16, there's more chances that uh, they will include young-based topics in their manifesto, which will, will put young people straight into the MP's uh, agenda, which therefore they have to try to, uh, to communicate with us in their region, because we are part of the citizens which they require that to receive votes from. Therefore, in a way, it secures the youth voice that way, rather than thinking well, maybe we can ignore them because they are, we, can, we can get the older people because they are more likely to vote. Therefore, in a way, this, sa this saves a platform for young people to be treated as equal citizens as the, or adults, really. Um, in my politics class, my politics teacher always says that in the Commons, MPs are majority male, pale and stale. So male, white and quite old. So I think that they don't have someone that they can feel they connect with or that represents them well because it's not very diverse. Whereas with a youth-led election, it's more diverse, there's more females involved, more ethnically diverse as well. So I think that's got a reason to do with why election, like general elections and things like that don't have a young people turn out well, very good one. Thank you. And this is kind of building on what Daisy was saying. Why do you think there is such a large gap between the turnout for youth elections and adult elections among young people? Um, if we'll start from Kyle again. I mean, I think the last point summed it up really well. In a youth election, you can relate to candidates so much more than you can in a general election, in, you know, in regional and council elections. You know, I think that that's a real part of it. I also think that youth elections have that youth work element to it. And that's really important because it's a different way of getting young people to engage. It's not purely polling card in the door, you know, go trudge along to your polling station, put an X in a box, go home. You know, th there's something around youth elections, which is, is not just go and cast your vote. It's actually give us your general views. It's you know, put yourself forward. There's a bit more to an election. I think that's really important because when you engage, that is engagement. Engagement, you know, democratic engagement is not just casting a vote. It's much broader. It's people being empowered to actually, you know, write to their MP. You know, it's to turn up at meetings. You know, again, you know, the referendum in Scotland. One of the interesting factors has been that the town hall meeting has been revived, uh, and you know, there's lots of hypotheses about why people are suddenly turning out to meetings again. But I think one of the reasons is there's a clear choice. You know, it's, it's yes or no. It's a referendum, and I think you know maybe modern politics could do a bit about kind of having cleaner choices, cleaner manifestos, you know, parties actually, you know, not being afraid to just stick their head above the parapet and say, actually, this is what you believe, like it or lump it, this is why you should vote for me. You know, so I think for young people, what they want is something a bit more relatable, but also something that, you know, that speaks to them, that has, as Peggy was saying, has those policies that appeal to young people, you know, not just, 
you know, for families and for older people, but actually things talking about what young people would quite like to see, because you know, politics should be a balance between all of the groups in society, not purely weighed, as I, as I sadly think it is at the moment, purely weighed towards certain groups who are more likely to vote. Um, I think, yeah, with, with, with youth elections, I think they're a lot more personal. Uh, the people involved certainly have to go out and do a lot more work, um, as it were, sort of, you know, in the field. And, and talking to a lot of young people, you know, day in, day out, you actually get a feel of what the kind of issues and the kind of general opinions of people are. Um, whereas I think, um, yeah, the, the, the prestige and the kind of, the, again, this just historical culture that Westminster has, I don't know, I think that... that in a way, prohibits it from um, from from being relatable to sort of normal people. Um, I think in um, general elections, it's quite difficult to vote because you may agree with one party on something, but then you agree with another party on something else. So you kind of have to put some effort and thought into like deciding who you're going to vote for. Whereas, like, make your mark is a topical ballot, um, and you look at the ballot, and there's always going to be two topics that stick out, or one. There's not going to be. You're not going to look at all of them and kind of go, yes, I want to vote for every single one of them. So I think more topical. I think politics needs to change. I mean, also like politicians, they say a lot of things and don't do half of them. I mean, make your mark. Votes at 16 was voted for, and it. Well, we're here right now, aren't we? We're doing what we said we would do. Whereas politicians can kind of say that they're going to do this, they're going to do that, and they don't do it. So I think young people kind of recognise that, and adults. So I think that's why, because youth do what they say they're going to do, really. Um, for example, um, I would say that it, it is totally true that, um, for example, um, youth parliament elections and make your mark has a better turnout. For example, um, Yorkshire and Humber uh, PG had the highest number of ballots in total uh, as an NYP as well. So that clearly shows that the way um, young people engage with other young people is effectively working. For example, um, how many times would I see my MP? Probably once since he's been elected. So that's it. that really shows that, um, for example, because young citizens are standing for elections themselves, so they relate to young people. Like, for example, as Daisy said, um, how many, what's the majority of young, younger people in Westminster as MPs? Really though, you don't even really, they don't even really count it. You can, you can argue that. Um, and also by modernising the system, for example, um, young people, they, they might get put off by general elections because they might, they might feel like they have to follow what their parents are doing because, because they like a party. They, they are forced to do that part, to go for that party. Whereas for youth elections, this is not like that at all. You, you vote for what promises they are making. And if they are not doing that, you, they will be voted out after two years. So in a way, we have more control, and young people are more controlling what, what we do as a member of youth parliament than what MPs do for us as a, as a region. So in a way, I feel like the system is hindering what young people c can do and what they can influence. So I think that needs changing, hopefully after the vote 16. I don't want to sound like I'm repeating myself, because I kind of answered it before, didn't I? But, um, I'd like to state as well that we're already kind of making a difference with having a youth parliament that's growing in popularity. It kind of introduces young people to politics, like us sat in this room, we're kind of an actual breathing fact of it. So I think we, well, some of us might even become MPs, which will inc like increase diversity, increase diversity in gender, ethnicity, etc. So I think we already are, are already making a difference to the young people vote, but votes at 16 would be. Thank you. I'll pass it over to Brandon. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming. What would you like to see done to engage more people in politics, more young people in particular? Carl? Yep, absolutely. I mean, this is the golden question. Uh, if I always say if I had the answer to it completely, then I'd be in a beach in Barbados somewhere. But, you know, I think that in terms of engaging young people, it's, it's the things that I've said before. It's politics talking some of the time about young people's issues. It's, you know, and it's politicians and it's candidates for election making an effort to go out and talk to young people. You know, I will give MPs and politicians of all cues, they generally like to talk to young people, they like to be seen to be talking to young people. Engaging is another matter altogether. And, you know, I think you know, 
it's again, it's talking about those issues, it's being relatable, it's using structures like youth parliaments, youth councils, these formal structures, youth forums, to have that kind of engagement in a supported way. Uh, and I think just more generally, you know, I think if politics is a bit more about, you know, what can you do for our country rather than what what's the worst thing that the other people are going to do for the country. I think if we had politics, it was a bit more about the positive rather than negative, then we could engage young people, you know, in a much better way. Um, I'll just sort of uh, reiterate what Carl said. I think that, yes, yeah, so the, the organisations that we have in place at the moment, um, the, the councils all, all across the country and the youth parliament itself, they're great um, for, for getting together, debating, talking about these issues, going out and talking to people in our areas about what they think. Um, it's great for young people in general. Um, I think that we need to press maybe for, for something to be done in, in terms of like uh, the curriculum to maybe um, to help students, to help inform them of the, the real world out there and um, the politics that goes on and some of the issues and try and help them form their own, you know, critical arguments, try and help them to reason and come to, come to sort of uh, inform conclusions instead of having them uh, leaving school at the age of 18, um, not really knowing too much about some of the issues um, and, and, and therefore just being discouraged to vote because they don't, they don't see maybe how it directly affects them. Um, I think, yeah. Um, I would second what those guys have just said. Um, I think education is a massive push. I think young people need to have more of an understanding. Um, a new idea, though, I think, is politics needs to change. I mean, one argument I've had against um, Votes at 16 is that all the resources are there and that young people still aren't using them. Yeah, you can Google a political party and it comes up with a massive manifesto which nobody's going to read unless you're ridiculously sad like me. So it's a bit pointless having a massive manifesto that doesn't relate to young people. There's 90% of words that don't need to be there. Words are too long. They don't need... It's just jargon. Half of it doesn't need to be there. Why can't it be reduced? I mean, do adults even read that? I highly doubt it. And I think it's just far too formal and it just needs to be completely changed for young people and for adults. Because in the next few generations, young people are just not going to get involved if it doesn't change. Uh, this also uh, shows the importance of uh, young people to think independently. For example, um, if, we, if we actually really think about the majority of young people, they, they, are fed as a, uh, they are fed on what they have to think. For example, they can't um, make a conclusion independently. What's the pro pros and cons of something? What shall I believe? What is my set of mind? And therefore, as um, the guy said, that um, young people really are not given the independence to think on what they want to think. For example, um, the definition of politics is to resolve conflicts and confusions. But how many young people really do know that? The policy, the policy politic is a something that they really don't like because it's never been explained to them and they see politics as, as an ambiguous term because they don't know what it really is. So in a way, I think uh, with the support of councils and hopefully UK of Parliament and the government, young people will start to prepare for, 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 for their curriculum for life and hopefully to make a bigger turnout for the general elections. So I think it's, it's vital for young people to know it. I don't think there's anything I really need to add. I kind of would just be repeating what everyone else has said. Um, we've heard from uh, Thea earlier that councils um, in, or in areas like Barnsley and Reading, there's higher turnouts for young people. Um, does this then have an effect on youth engagement? And does this then, this higher or the effect on youth engagement, does this have an effect on young people's influence on policy locally? I'll start with Kyle. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it inevitably does because, you know, if you think of them as community groups, youth councils, things, you know, if there's, if the more people join these kind of groups, the better, the bigger a voice it has. And actually, you'll find that local politicians in particular, you know, want to hear from these groups. You know, they, they are generally very proactive and want to seek out those views. And they give young people, I think, the first steps into how you, how you actually use the system to make your views known, how the system is meant to work in terms of making sure that people represent, or at least, you know, if they don't represent your views, to tell you why they don't represent your views. So I think, you know, they, 
if they're well set up, if they're well managed, if they make a real you know point of having those links set up, then I think they, they can help young people to boost that. And I think the more young people that join, the more they're likely to kind of hear. And actually, I think one of the big things is if these bodies have real decision-making powers, I think co-design is a real kind of prospect. Co-design is where young people and adults sit around the table and they're both empowered to make decisions. And I think if young people see that these bodies aren't just talking shops, if they see that they're actually real, you know, active, you know, bodies which do what and I mean the Scottish Youth Parliament, you know, I'm really proud that we can now, you know, if you, I almost can rhyme off the successes we've had around equal marriage, the votes at, C, at 16 Bill, a living wage, uh, our action for young carers and our care fair share campaign this year. So I think for us we now have a better sell to young people themselves because we can say to them, look, you're not just coming here and debating. You're coming here because we do real things. We take real action on what young people tell us. And I think that brings more young people into the process. And I think inevitably, you know, you start creating generations of empowered young people you know, who know how to use their vote. And if you like, know that their MPs and their councillors and their MSPs, etc., are there to represent them, you know, and they're actually quite happy to send the letters, the emails, the phone calls, to come up to them at events, talk to them about things. So I think they, they can have a real impact and connect, but you know they've got to do real things in their communities. And actually, the great thing about what we have now is that you know it's more and more these bodies are less just you know youth groups in a different name. They're actually now becoming empowered you know groups of young people who are making real change either in their local areas or you know in our own case nationally. You know it's, it's, th there is now real evidence to show that they make change in their areas, and that's you know the best argument for them. Um, yeah, it's a great first step for sort of engaging younger people with politics um, for later in life, you know, the process of, of voting for, for a certain person and then, and then talking with those people in your area about the issues and what you think the issues are. Um, I think that's, that's great. We actually saw a turnout nearly, well, there was 800, 800 more people who voted in the, in the Reading Youth Cabinet elections this year than the year before, um, which is a good increase. Uh, it was about 5,000 people, which is about a third of the, of the young people in Reading. Um, and, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure sort of how seriously some of these organisations are, ta are taken sometimes. I know, I know that the, the MPs that, that we've worked with, um, often we've spoken to them uh, and they kind, of, they kind of go away and, and forget about us a bit and don't really try and cooperate with us and work with us to help tackle some of the issues which are important for young people in our area. But... Um, could you repeat the question, please? So it's um, in councils such as Barnsley and areas such as Barnsley and Reading, young people are coming out in higher turnout. Does this have an effect on the youth engagement in the area? And does this youth engagement have an effect on the influence young people have on policy in local area? Yeah, um, I mean, definitely. We have quite a good relationship with our local councillors. Um, I mean, um, John Ennis in particular, who is lead on education, we've been in contact often. He actually set up the motion for Reading Borough Council to pass votes of 16. Um, so yeah, I mean, the fact that we've got the same um, turnout in elections as the adults really is a good stat to have because it kind of turns around and says, you know, young people are just as involved as adults, so why can't we have the vote also? Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, I think that this allows um, uh, connections uh, within the constituencies. For example, this might um, uh, improve the relationship between MPs and young people, which, for example, UK is a very, very blurred age majority, which you really don't know what is the minimum age for various activities. Um, for example, um, young people may feel more confident with their youth councillors. Uh, and also councillors as well, which um, evidently in Barnsley we um, had a transport um, a ticket which allowed young people to travel free around Barnsley for, for free of charge in 2009. And um, they came back to youth council and then they said, we, we don't have the budget but we still want to keep it. And just because of, um, uh, of, of councillors having that attitude, young people praise our councillors and then they feel as though they are included in, in, in their agenda, which um, uh, really has improved a lot of things. For example, this might have a lot of effects, such as reducing the crime level in your area, because uh, young people feel like they don't need to catch the councillors' attention by committing crimes or anything else, which might 
if, if we do not allow them to have a voice, it might have a side effect on, on people and also education because they probably will not be committed to have education and improve their life, really. Well, in Oldham, we have a close relationship with the Youth Council, the young people and the Youth Council and the Council. We're written into the Constitution, so our Council like can't get rid of us. So like we get to speak at, at full Council meetings and put forward what we think on behalf of the young people. So we consult with young people about votes at 16, and then we went to the Council and said, we'd like your support, please show, and they all voted in favour of votes at 16. So. And we're kind of in the council building, we're moving into, so we'll be a close-knit, like, kind of organisation then. So, yeah. Thank you. I'll pass you on to Jack for the next question. Unfortunately, we're running uh, slightly short of time, so if you could keep your answers as brief as possible, it would be appreciated. Good morning. Um, whose responsibility should it be to engage young people in politics and current affairs? And we'll start with David. Oh. <sighs> on the spot, I'm used to having loads of time. Um, <laughs> I think it's a joint effort for people, so schools, government, local government. I think um, with we have a, um, I forgot its name, a day, like a week, local democracy week, that's it, and it's like you can shadow councillors and things like that, and that gets people involved in politics, so our local council's doing their bit, youth councils can do their bit, and schools with adding it into the curriculum and things like that, I think, is what's needed. Can you repeat the question? Whose responsibility should it be to engage with young people in politics and current affairs? So who should talk? I would say definitely um, the, main, the government has to make the first move. For example, if, if we make the voting uh, or... Um, uh, PSHE compulsory within schools that's that's a step taken so therefore this allows um, you councils and schools to, to, to have a delegated power to enforce the, those changes for example some some schools really do get away with um, not teaching students about why we should vote and a half of people that I, I talk about they've never had a lesson about what is voting what is general election what is MP they don't know anything about it and if I'm being honest, I really didn't know about about it until I sat in AS government politics, which helped me to know why why we have it. So I think it, w it would definitely be the government first, and then after that our councils, and then after that it will be our schools. Well, at present it isn't anyone's responsibility because we don't have anything that says politics has to be educated, so it's not schools' responsibilities, nor do we have the vote, so it's not politicians' responsibilities. But once we do have the votes at 16, then it's going to be the politicians' responsibility, in my opinion, because they're the ones getting the votes. And the government will have to kind of introduce laws and set education around politics. So I think it's no one's responsibility until we actually get the vote. Um, I think it is, it's, the, it's the duty to prepare young people for later in life. And the way you do that is through education. The people who set the curriculum of the government, so therefore it should be the government's responsibility. But I think, um, I mean, I don't feel as if um, currently those like, at Westminster would like to change the curriculum and would like to inform young people of, of politics and all these worldly processes. I think they would like to keep them um, in the dark about it a little bit uh, because I think it's in their favour to hold on to, hold on to their power um, and not to teach young people about these, these issues and, and involve them. I think it's everybody's responsibility. I don't think democracy can be left to a single group or to a single person. I think the whole point about democracy is it's something for everyone. It's government by people. And I think everyone has to be involved, whether that's parents talking about it at dinner table, whether that's you know, the government making sure that there's lessons and there's laws in place, that's teachers, that's society in general. You know, civil society has a massive role to play in engaging young people. A very, I know it's a very broad point, but I think everybody has their little part to play. And the young people who are get involved in politics, generally they have all of the different people in their lives encouraging them that way. And I think we just need to, you know, we need to say to people, look, you know, in talking to young people about politics isn't something that's bad. You know, we encourage it, encourage debate, you know, encourage a very general kind of open debate, because that can only benefit democracy in a very general sense of everybody 
is trying to get young people to be interested, because actually in the referendum on independence in Scotland, that's exactly what's going on, where everyone is working hard to make sure 16 and 17 olds know about the vote, are registered to vote and will turn out to vote. And you know, all the signs are that actually that's you know making a lot of positive change. And I think it will be reflected, it's reflected in registration figures, and I think that idea of this collective effort will also be reflected in turnout. Yeah, we want to follow, up, please. So you've all touched on citizenship education in some way. You're all involved in more practical ways of engaging young people with society than just learning about it in the classroom. Do you think there should be more practical, practical political aspects to citizenship education? And what kinds of things would you like to see? If we start with Daisy again. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to see more, like in a practical way, like debating in schools. It's very popular in America, I know, like um, going around to different schools debating in front of people, but it doesn't seem to be very popular here. And I'd like to see it because it's quite a entertaining way of getting people involved in politics. It can be quite exciting and that's not how you describe politics normally is it so it would be a good way thank you definitely i would say um for example there's a um there's a uh, politic uh, a work that you can do is called my journey to school where um young people get gathered into a table together and um they talk about what uh, during their journey to school what are the political things that happen that happens to them? For example, their tickets, um, the safety of roads, and and I have to say this was the most successful thing that I've ever done because young people really didn't know there were politics included, just as a simple journey as that. And also, as Daisy said, uh, debating teams are really effective as well. Such as my sixth form, we have a debating team and we go across. Uh, West Yorkshire and South Yorkshire and we have uh, debating uh, competitions with other colleges which uh, really really does um, get people's attention in our college and they really look forward to even hear it and no, mind participate so thank you Ellie <laughs> I think it needs to be interactive so I'm sure most of you have heard by the ballot um, they have brilliant resources um, something kind of involves them standing up and like deciding yes or no and kind of getting on your feet and actually doing something like it's really interactive. I mean, there's celebrities involved with them and stuff like that, which is brilliant. So I think it needs to be interactive. I don't think it's going to be great if there's a teacher stood up against a whiteboard or something like with a presentation about it because I would fall asleep. Um, so I really think it needs to be interactive, and I think the resources I've seen from Byte Ballot are a perfect example of that. Girls, you were nodding along there. Do you agree with that? Yeah. You do. David. I'll just reiterate what the others say because I also agree with them. Um, it certainly shouldn't just be something you're taught, um, you know, this is politics, you know. It's certainly something that should be free, uh, you know, involve free thinking and debate, you know, classroom discussion, um, getting, getting teachers involved and, uh, yeah, having, having sort of practical, practical um, uh, things, yeah. Thank you. I mean, I think, as I said in answer to a previous question, I think it's got to have a purpose. I think debating, as much as it's good, debating is a very middle class affair. You know, I think you get young people, real young people involved through practical things. It's not, it's activities with a purpose. So you just turn up and say what you think and go home and that's the end of it. It's you turn up, you say what you think and then you take action because of it. And I think that's how you engage young people in schools. Citizen, citizenship education in schools very often, you know, young people don't rate it very highly because it's simply telling you what, what you know. You've got to have the nuts and bolts. This is how it works. But I think schools need to be proactive in providing those opportunities. Whether that's working with their youth council in their area, whether that's their own pupil council, whether that's working with their members of the youth parliament, providing that opportunity for young people to take what they've learned and apply it in a practical sense, to go out and to actually make their views known, to engage in real politics and real democracy. And that's where young people go from simply sitting, you know, slightly bored, slightly tedious kind of education and actually being really passionate and caring about what they're doing. And I think once you get people to that stage, once once there's a, there's a switch that goes in your mind, it happens for me, it happens for everyone's involved in this, once you realise that actually you can do something, you can make change, you can have your voice heard, once you've turned that switch on, you can't turn it off. And I think if we can get more people to that stage, we can then, you know, have real, proper, engaging education. Education with a purpose, not just education for the sake of. There's a curriculum that says I've got to teach it, so I'm going to just do it in the most boring way possible. You know, we need everyone to kind of have it. You know, it's got to have links through. It can't just be a one-off. Thank you.
Thank you, Pasha, and to Thank you. Yes, um, so kind of getting to the crux of um, this committee. Um, quickly, just a quick yes or no, that's a wary of time. Um, do you all believe in lowering the voting age to 16? Anybody that doesn't? Okay, I'd just like, because I know um, some of you already said points for why you believe it should be lowered. Um, David and Daisy, could you just briefly expa explain why you think it should be? Because I don't think you could. Okay, you? Um, yeah, well, I mean, people who are people who are age 16 have plenty of uh, rights in like, our modern day society, you know, the, the ability to get married and, and to have children, start your own family. You know, there are plenty of things which you're subject to, but the fact that you can't vote for these things which you're supposedly allowed to do, you know, it, it, to me, it, it doesn't really it doesn't really make sense. Uh, but do you not think there are rights that um, at other ages that contradict that, such as jury service at, at eighteen and um, things like? Um, I, I don't really know. I don't personally have, have, a, have a definite opinion. It's a it's a big issue. I can't I can't give a, a yes or no answer. Sorry, Dave, we're a bit wary of time, so I've got to kind of. Yeah. Um, when we did the. Um, presentation to full council in Oldham we our point was kind of I could have sex with my MP which is what is said when we debate in the comments yeah um that you could drive your MP around I could chauffeur my MP now because I'm 16 and I can drive I can't but yeah I could I could um yeah so there's loads of reasons why you could and having a single age for everything would probably be a simpler answer but that isn't going to happen but yeah, I think, yeah, if that made sense, did it? I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, over to Orson. Uh, general public opinion seems to be against lowering the voting age. Uh, why do you believe this is? Yeah, I'll, I'll start on it. I mean, I, I genuinely don't think it is. I think what there is is a fear around what might happen. But I, th I don't think the general public are, are against young people having their say. I think actually most people in the public are quite heartened when they see young people, you know, actually using their rights, you know, speaking up. You know, in terms of the voting age, I would say public opinion in Scotland in terms of our reduction. I think at the start of it, it was probably 50-50. I think there are a lot of people who, I think most people are just quite unsure about what would happen. I don't think it's they're against, I think they're unsure. And what we've seen in terms of Scotland is actually public opinion, I think, has changed. Certainly, I've, I haven't got the research evidence to give you on it to hand, but my own general feeling is those who are against are suddenly sitting and thinking, well, actually, th these young people who we weren't quite sure about, they're taking this really seriously. They're actually taking it as more seriously than anything, you know, than many other groups. And the best example that we had on that was, you know, the, the argument we always got was, well, this is just, this is just Mr. Salmon's, you know, wanting to give all these young people the vote because they'll all vote for him. And what we've seen is young people have actually turned around and said, well, no, we want to be convinced, like any other age group, we want you to go out and we want you to make that case to us. It's still, the debate's still going on, but I think public opinion, you know, is unsure. I don't think it's against. And I think actually once you put votes at 16 in practice, public opinion changes because they see that actually young people are just as responsible and just as serious as any other part of the population in terms of their right to vote. Yeah, I think people are probably um, they're probably just you know unsure and, and speculative as to what would happen if such a law were to come into place. Um, I think also there's the the danger of potentially um, 16, 17 year olds you know trying to be manipulated by politicians. I, I don't know you know the extent of that. I don't know much, but um, I'm not I'm not too sure personally. I completely agree with what Kyle said. I think people are more unsure than against it. I know the question is about general public, but I know that some politicians are quite... We had quite a lot of opposition when we had to try and pass it through our council, and that's because, in my opinion, they're scared. They don't want to have to appeal to us and relate to us. They like it how it is now, and I think that they're worried that things would have to change and people don't like change. This is exactly talked about the charity as well. Um, your for example, um, a lot of people are worried about votes reduced to be 16 because it doesn't fit with um, our UK constituency and our political culture. But if we think about it, we always talk about wanting to have a change, we want to modernise our system. But if young people are not in our system, then we've lost it because young people are the only platform that we can get into modernising young people and the politics. So I think it definitely needs to be changed. 
Um, being on a youth council and being a youth mayor, you get a lot of older people say, um, "Oh, it's so good that you're on a that you want to make a difference. You're so involved. You're one of a few young people that would do that sort of thing." But I think they're scared of the unknown, like everyone else said. They're scared to. Of, they don't know what we do, we do we don't, they don't know how we do it, they don't know how much power we have and how much power we want, so they, they're just a bit scared, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Pasha. On to Sadia. If you had been able to vote since you were 16, do you think you would feel more engaged in politics now? And if we could keep it to kind of a yes or no kind of answer, that would be really appreciated and stuff kind. I think I would say I'm, I'm unsure. I think I was involved in politics before I was 16 anyway I was interested through the youth work side so I, I can give a straight yes or no on that one personally I think I probably would have been yeah 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 but I think we're quite biased are we not because we kind of we, we've been involved since we were quite young like I, before I was 16 I was involved so we're all mm. quite a bit like yeah of course we would we're involved in anyway. <laughs> thank you to uh, just Kyle Regarding the referendum on Scottish independence, are there any general lessons that you think we can learn um, from the voting age being lowered for this? Absolutely. I think the biggest lesson that we've learned is that if and when we give young people the right to vote at 16, registration is a really key part of that. But the fact that you know, we call, I've called it you know, the captive audience effect, you can actually get the vast majority of 16 and 17 year olds in schools colleges, universities, you can get them registered to vote because a lot of the time that's the, a lot of people just don't realise that they need to register first. I think a lot of work needs to go in when that vote is given. Uh, what we have learned is actually we all need to come together at the Scottish Youth Parliament. Uh, we not only have our own project through I Know Maybe, uh, which is our project in young voter registration funded by the Cabinet Office, but we also have you know, we coordinate a young voter engagement group which brings together the campaigns, the electoral commission, government, third sector. It's that collaborative approach is probably one of the biggest lessons that we've learned is that it's such a good way of doing it. We capture and we get to so many young people, you know, that way. And I think, you know, probably the biggest lesson, you know, that, that I would certainly learn from, you know, votes six is that young people you know, are just so ready for it, you know. We, we didn't have any evidence before, but one thing I've just seen is that young people are taking this really quite seriously. It's not just, you know, yeah, yeah they're, they're going to trudge along to vote. Their mum and dad's telling them that you better turn out and vote, son, in the referendum. It's actually young people are really passionate. People disagree. People have conversations. The big lesson we've learned, you know, and as I said, one of the other lessons we've learned is that when you give young people, especially that straight choice, that clear, distinctive choice about what they're voting for on the ballot paper, they are just so much more likely to engage and to want to turn out, I mean already we're looking at, we definitely know that around 66% of young people in that age group are definitely going to turn out to vote, I mean compared to the low 40s that we normally have for 18 to 24 year olds in general elections, you know, that, that's an amazing kind of figure and I think finally what I would say is that 16 and 17 year olds you know, are very distinctive from the 18 to 24 year old group, we've learned that, 18 to 24 year olds are difficult to engage for a whole variety of reasons. People change, people move in their lives. It's hard to people pin down, but for 16, 17 year olds, you know, it's much, so much easier to engage. We can get there, we can get them in. And I think actually, once we get people to vote for the first time, once we get people to vote for that first time in a ballot box, they'll then, you know, they'll then turn out future elections. And I think the question that's gonna be posed to our politicians is nine months later, regardless of the outcome, there will be a general election which everyone 18 and above will be able to vote in. And there's going to be a lot of 16, 17 year olds sitting asking the questions to their MP, why have I not got the right to vote in this election? Surely the future of my country you know, was more important than a general election. So why on earth, if I was responsible enough for that vote, why am I not responsible enough for a general election? And I think that's the point where a lot of politicians who are on the fence are going to suddenly have to accept the principle that we have set that young people are responsible to vote. Thank you. Uh, just conscious of time uh, to all the panel, if you were writing a report on votes at 16 to the government, which recommendations would you include? Can I start with Daisy, please? No. Please, can you come back to me? Yes, yeah, but I'll start, start with Kyle. <laughs> well, I, mean, I mean, I think in general, I would say to the government, young people are ready to vote. We've got clear evidence that young people vote. We can see what's happening in Scotland, that when you give that vote, young people take it, they run away with it. But I think also it's saying to government that 
you need to also fund and support proper youth engagement. Uh, things like youth parliaments, youth voice vehicles, and youth work in particular, you know, as a way of getting young people engaged and involved. Because if you can't connect young people at the very first stage, then you're never going to get them later on. So I think, yes, votes at 16, absolutely. But I think I, along with votes at 16, is that real support for that youth work element to give young people that opportunity to engage, to question, and to get into politics in a very general sense. Because I think you need to have that connect for young people. You can't just simply give a right without having that connect. But I think that, and it's a bit of a paradox, but I think once you give that right, then that will all fall in, in place. I think you, you have a duty in that sense to then go ahead and put that support in. David? Um, I think education could be used um, to, to try and smoothen the transition between sort of this period of being at school and going into the adult world. If there was a bit more of a, you know, like a curriculum for life, which, um, which looks at some of the more adult issues and tries to you know, engage people in, in, in politics, perhaps that kind of interwoven everyday life um, element of it at school would, um, would yeah, help. Um, I would second the education and also I said earlier about politics and of course you can't write in your report that um, the manifestos are really boring but perhaps um, talk about changing politics, changing how it appeals to young people, perhaps having a separate manifesto for young people so that people can digest it or kind of making it more accessible to young people. Yeah, definitely. Uh, as Ellie said, um, I think the uh, first step that we need to take forward is to simplify politics, because, um, as I said previously, it, it is quite ambiguous with the way mandates are set, manifestos, what th what our po MPs and um, promises were, where are they available, where can we find it, what promises have our actual councillors have given us. So I think it's it's more about the bond, um, which I think the government and the council needs to work on and also uh, to show support on what, what young people feel strong about uh, such as if, if, the, if the area of young people believe in Vote 16 show them support so definitely I think it's more about bond of people. Yeah I'd agree with Kyle I'd say as well stop quitting the youth service because we've come so far with it like a lot of us have come through the youth service to do things like we're doing today and sat in this room. Cutting it would slow down what we've already done to make ourselves go forward in young people in politics. Okay, thank you. I'd once again like to thank everyone for attending today's um, oral evidence session regarding votes at 16. All of the evidence which uh, you've all given will be used for our report. That's the end of the committee. Thank you. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, second sitting of our um, inquiry into votes at 16. I'd like to rem remind everyone that you can engage with the, debater, uh, sorry, the debate on Twitter using the hashtag you've select. Uh, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Emma Whiting and I'm the project manager for the Parliament, Parliament's Education Service uh, for the Education Programme Development Team. Thank you. I'd like to um, pass you over to Louise for our first question. Hi. Can you describe the work that Parliament does to engage young people in politics? Please? Sure. So Parliament's Education Service works with schools and members of both Houses of Parliament to provide free support to young people in developing their understanding about a democracy in Parliament. And we're really, really passionate about young people's entitlement to connect with their Parliament and democracy and we want to give as many young people as possible the opportunity to do this. 
and we work with young people aged 7 to 18 and also teachers both here in Parliament and uh, in schools and everything we do is underpinned by the aim to bring Parliament to life for young people and all our, focus, our services are focused around informing young people about what Parliament does and how it works, about why it's relevant to them, how it affects them, but also why they are relevant to Parliament, that the young people can make a difference, that it's their Parliament, and around um, inspiring and empowering them to actually engage with parliamentary process and democratic processes. So what we feel is that the history of Parliament is really valuable and it does form quite a strong part about what we, part of our programmes, but so is the future of Parliament. Parliaments are continually evolving organisation and we want young people to really get an understanding of how their role can be part of that evolution. So we currently welcome around 45,000 students a year through our programmes, through the education service programmes, and uh, we have a range of programmes that they can interact with. Uh, visiting us here at Parliament, they can have a school tour uh, of Parliament, of the, of the building. They can have a school tour and plenary session, which we call Introduction to Parliament. And they can also have a school tour and workshop. And our workshops are, have three themes. There's making laws, um, elections and voting, and your voice. And as your previous witnesses were sort of talking about, this, the whole idea about making Parliament come to life and interactivity, that forms a key part of these workshops. We want to make it feel as inspiring and as exciting as possible to be here and learn about what, how they can interact with Parliament. Um, for each of these workshops, we also invite MPs, the, the constituency MP for the school, to come along. And uh, around about 50% uh, of our, our school visits actually are able to meet with their MP, a peer, or their constituency representation. Alongside these, we have seasonal programmes, one of which is Discover Parliament, and we run this in the autumn term for A-level and AS students. And this is a, an opportunity for them to uh, meet experts, uh, which may well be MPs or peers, as well as university professors, clerks, parliamentary security officials, journalists, and they also explore in detail the role of the MP. Uh, so last uh, 2013 programme, we had around 174 groups visiting us through that, and that amounted to 4,571 students and joined the Discover programme. We have a select committee experience, which is for A-level students, which gives them the opportunity to explore the evolution, the structure and the function of the select committee experience. And they also participate in a debate on the question of uh, are select committees an effective and efficient way of scrutinising government. We have student parliament debates, where we invite students from schools to come along and participate in a debate that follows the rules and conventions of either the House of Commons or the House of Lords. And we also have a transport subsidy scheme, which is there to enable schools from further afield to come and visit us. We know not, it's a bit more difficult for those further afield to come to actually visit Parliament, and we want to make it as accessible to them as possible. As well as the programmes that actually take place in Parliament, we have an outreach service, and we go out to classrooms and conduct workshops in classrooms. And they're paired with a dedicated teacher training session as well, with the idea that we're there to inform students about Parliament, but also to help teachers in their teaching about Parliament, about bringing Parliament to life for their students. So with the aim of sort of leaving a legacy from our service to them, so we can continue that forward. And we've actually got an expanding team there. We've, had, we've got regionally based outreach staff now uh, in the northwest, the northeast, and the southwest. And we have a dedicated teacher training coordinator that's recently joined the team. And teacher training is a big part of the outreach service as well. And we offer various different training and, and continued professional development opportunities, um, both again in schools and here. We have teacher seminars and a teacher's institute, which is at, one of which is actually happening uh, this week as we speak here on, in Parliament. And we have worked with around 500 teachers through these training programmes over the last year. And we have loan boxes, which again, going back, I'm slightly repeating myself, but this idea of bringing Parliament to life in schools. And the loan boxes sort of try to do that in a relatively literal sense in that they uh, have props and resources in the box that, uh, such as uh, a robe for the speaker, a clerk's wig, a backdrop to show the commons, just so that in the classroom students can feel as though they're part of Parliament. Um, Alongside all these, as a sort of supplement to the actual face-to-face -face interaction with students and teachers, we have digital and hard copy resources. Um, so these are there to help students and teachers engage uh, it, with Parliament on, in their sort of own, own time and own classes. So these range from activity and information booklets, video resources, um, we have an election toolkit that we've recently launched. Uh, and we also have a Parliament Games website, which is uh, there to provide some really great games. You can be an MP for a day, you can go on the campaign trail, you can try and clean Big Ben whilst asking, answering questions about Parliament. So it's a great way and a fun way of engaging young people with Parliament. 
And finally, we have a couple of competitions that we run. Lights Camera Parliament is, uh, invites young people to tell us about what law they'd make uh, in the UK through a film. And the Speaker School Council Awards uh, invites school councils to tell us about what projects they've done that have had a really great impact on their community or school. And we've had a really great year with these. We had over 200 entries to Lights Camera Parliament and over 700 entries to Speaker School Council Awards. So that's been really um, great to see such inspiring projects. And I think that's a really important thing. We're, sort of a, we're continually wanting to hear from our audience. We're continually moving forward. We want to be as responsive as possible and make sure that we're providing the best possible service that we can to schools and young people. And with that in mind, it's been a really great year for us. Uh, we've actually received planning permission for a new education centre, which will open in the spring. And uh, that will enable us to double our visitors, so we'll go up to around about 100,000 visitors a year with that. And it's going to be a great new space, a great new resource, and it will give us a good opportunity to really think about expanding and developing our programme and engaging with as many young people as possible. Thank you. I'd like to pass you over to Joe. Thank you. Very comprehensive answer <laughs> on the work. Um, I'd just like to ask, why does Parliament provide this service? Sure. So. Um, as far as I understand it, there's been an education function in Parliament for the last sort of 25 or 30 years. Uh, but it's really in the last sort of seven or eight years that the education service has really um, expanded and grown. And that's in part, I believe, due to uh, various factors, one of which may be that the uh, citizenship became a statutory curriculum entitlement in 2002. And around about the turn of the century, there were some reports that were published, for example, the Putnam Commission on the Communication of Parliamentary Democracy, that were suggesting that the public and young people in particular were disengaged with or felt alienated from Parliament and recommending that Parliament needed to involve and engage the public much more effectively in its work. So these sort of factors, among others, I'm sure, uh, came together to form a sort of momentum for change, and the education service arose out of that uh, as part of this wider drive for much more meaningful, effective public engagement. Uh, and there's other services such as the parliamentary outreach service that is also a really strong part of um, what we do to engage with the public. Um, so I think that's all driven us to the point where we have this great education service that's, as I say, continually evolving and expanding. And it exists now in its current form precisely because of those aims I sort of mentioned earlier around informing young people about what Parliament does. It's so important. But helping them to understand why they're relevant to Parliament, why it's relevant to them, what they can do, that they can make a difference. And Parliament does represent citizens of all ages. And around that sort of empowering role, we're there to empower young people to think about how they can engage with Parliament, however they want, whether that's through meeting an MP, campaigning, or ultimately voting. Thank you. Thank you. Jack has the next question. Can you tell us what is one of your most successful projects mm -hmm. and then is there one that has gone less well? Okay. Um, I think really in the sense of our, our work, the most successful thing has been the Visits programme. Um, this is hugely popular, continually oversubscribed. We have uh, bookings days each term and we all have our available slots are booked out in the first couple of hours, um, which is... Really, it's great to see, but it's hard for us because we really want to do as much as possible to ensure we're seeing as many students as we can. And that's why the Education Centre is such an important thing for us because it means that this visits programme can keep expanding, it can keep growing, and we can see even more people than we, than we, excuse me, than we currently do. Um, so that's been our, I think, real success for us. Something which is perhaps a challenge for us is um, I, I guess around some of our resources what you know we as I say we really want to inform people as much as possible and our desire to give them as much information as possible some needs to be balanced with actually what young people and teachers need from us how do they want to use those resources um, in the past we've had some perhaps quite text heavy resources that are perhaps not that that user friendly and what we've done more recently is think much more about um, an audience focus for these thinking about actually um, can we engage more with the audience in the development of these resources, do more user testing, evaluation, feedback, learning from what, how they're being used in the classroom or with students. Um, so that's meaning our, our resources can grow and be much more effective. Thank you. Theo has our next question. In your experience, are young people interested in politics? Sure. Um, we find that young people, certainly from our perspective in terms of our services, engage with our services uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, they may come because they're just interested in learning a bit more about the society and about the, the parliament, that, that, that it should be theirs. Um, they might come to see an iconic building, or they might be coming because what we're uh, engaging them with is complementary to their studies, whether they're studying government and politics or citizenship. Um, 
And we find that it, uh, those latter group, the, the students uh, that are sort of studying these areas, may well be much more aware or interested in, in the political system. Nevertheless, we do find that students that we meet are engaged and interested in events or issues that are affecting them or their family and friends or the school or their community. So that might be education, employment, housing, jobs, um, the environment. And they might not recognise it as, as such, but I think that is a kind of clear demonstration of their political engagement. And that comes through really strongly for us in our competitions. So I mentioned Lights Camera Parliament and, and Speaker School Council Awards. With Lights Camera Parliament, as I say, we, we ask them to tell us about what law they would like to introduce in the UK. And we get some amazing uh, ideas come back to us of those 200 entries, um, ranging from banning trousers worn below underpants to uh, no smoking and cyberbullying. So there's a huge range of engagement with issues that they feel affect them. The winning entries included larger fines for litterers, um, a, a, a law that would in, enforce all manufacturers to state on their products, products whether child labour had been used in their production, <laughs> lower speed limits outside schools, and inspections for school meals. So again, a really big range in demonstrating how important these issues are to young people. Similarly, for Speaker School Council Awards, we ask school councils to tell us about projects that they uh, have felt have really made a difference in their school and community. And again, the winning entries have been really inspiring. We had um, our four to seven category uh, in the southwest campaigned to prevent the dumping of polyisobutane in the sea, which was killing wildlife, and that seemed to have a real big, a really huge impact. And the RSPCA picked it up, and that's had a, a huge amount of success for them. We had a project about raising uh, awareness about young people's mental health. Um, we had a project that was young people identifying what career options they'd like to go forward and the, then arranging with teachers to have focused lessons around those skills. And a great project where um, a school for students with special educational needs set up a charity shop which would help those students uh, achieve much, uh, some work, workplace skills so that they could take that out. And I know that a couple of the students have already got jobs and that model is being expanded to other schools. So I think the important thing about all those projects is that they have all been instigated and all been led by young people. So they really do show an active engagement with local and national politics. Thank you. Funaini has the next question. So in terms of implementing action, um, what are you doing to join up with the government um, on its work to engage with young people and in democracy and dependent on time, could we keep our answers brief? Yeah, of course. Um, so it's, it's our responsibility to uh, ensure young people are connected with the democratic process as it happens here and we really want to give them the knowledge and understanding about how they want to engage with Parliament and the democratic process as they wish. And we understand that our work to engage young people in these uh, uh, parts of uh, parliament and, policy, and politics and the democratic process is part of a much wider context um, of work being conducted by other organisations that are working in a similar area around engaging and empowering young people and giving them a voice. And we feel it's really important wherever we can to, to link up with those organisations and to place ourselves within a wider network uh, to the benefit of all the audiences of all those groups. Um, and we worked with various organisations such as the British Youth Council, the Smart School Councils, Community, the Citizenship Foundation, TrueTube, uh, the Nottingham Galleries for Justice, Make Ways, which are a social, safe social media site for schools. So I think really we're, we're just trying to place ourselves as much as we can in the, in the bigger picture around engaging young people in these matters that really are going to affect them and how they can have a voice in those. Thank you. You were writing a report uh, to the government which recommendations would you include? I understand that due to your position you can't voice yeah. an opinion yeah. on, on votes at 16, but do you have um, recommendations on other factors such as um, youth engagement with government? Again, I couldn't, I couldn't comment on anything around that. The Parliament's Education Service is a, a non-partisan service and we can't comment on anything relating to, to government. Okay, that's great. Well, I would uh, like to thank you for coming today to provide the evidence to our committee and uh, the evidence that you provided will be used in our report. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you for having Bye. me.
Hi there, I'd like to welcome you to the British Youth Council's Youth Select Committee on Boats at 16. Apologies for uh, running behind schedule. I would like to remind everyone that you can uh, engage with the debate on Twitter using the hashtag Youth Select. Can you please introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Russell. Uh, I'm a Professor of Politics at the University of Manchester, I'm head of the department there. Um, I was, uh, I've been researching youth engagement in politics now um, since I was a youth. Uh, and. Uh, I suppose I'm probably best known for writing, uh, uh, writing a couple of reports for the uh, research reports for the Electoral Commission. So the 2002 report into young people and, and uh, young people and uh, voter engagement, um, um, and uh, I was a co-author on a uh, on a similar report on a um, black and minority ethnic engagement in, in the 2001 general election. That led to me serving on the Electoral Commission's project board, which looked into the age of majority. Um, uh, which recommended um, which recommended lowering the age, equalising the age uh, at which uh, um, people could stand for election. So it used to be 21, it came down to 18. Uh, and I think through my academic career, that's probably the thing that I'm, of which I'm most proud. Um, we re we uh, did not recommend uh, lowering the voting age and then uh, uh, and, uh, when I was on the Electoral Commission, and those two um, recommendations were adopted into the Electoral Administration Act of 2006. Thank you. I'll pass you on to Theo. You are, clear <clears throat> you are clear in your written evidence that you're against lowering the voting age to 16. Can you explain why? Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of an unusual posi position for me because I've, I've written about youth <laughs> rights for such a long time that people, I, can, I think, Kind of assume that I would that, that I, I would be in favour of of lowering the voting age, but it's actually because I'm in favour of increasing young people's uh, engagement with politics, and I think that the I think the voting age is kind of a kind of a sideshow. I think that we that the the rights for vulnerable young people have been have been hard fought, and I could see some of those really put, be, being put under significant danger. Um, if suddenly we have to treat 16 and 17 year olds as full citizens. So for instance, uh, um, under 18s presenting as homeless, uh, local authorities have a statutory uh, a, a, a commitment to, uh, to, uh, to rehouse uh, homeless under 18s, thanks to Law Lords Act, uh, um, Judgment of 2009. Uh, and those, uh, I think it's harder to maintain those rights if suddenly 16 and 17s are, are no longer regarded as vulnerable uh, young people, but full citizens. I think many of the arguments that we've heard from uh, engaged groups um, talk about rights which are, in, which are frankly diminishing, marginal to the act of voting, uh, uh, and, uh, or, or maybe even irrelevant. Uh, and I think it's, you know that there are, that there's, an, there's an awful lot of confusion over over things that. Under 18s need parental permission to do, uh, uh, um, such as uh, uh, marrying in England, Scotland, and, and Northern Ireland, um, uh, such as joining the armed forces throughout the UK. Um, uh, things that, things that uh, uh, they no longer do, such as marrying. So, 50 years ago, 4,000 16-year-old girls got married in England and Wales. In 2009, it was le it was 88. Right, so 4,000 down to less than 100. Um, uh, and uh, and then there are uh, uh, rights that people no longer do, such as uh, uh, the school leaving age. Uh, Parliament has legislated in England, at least, to raise the participation age, which is a, a, a effectively a recognition of where we are anyway, with with 92% of us uh, of post 16 staying on in England and Wales. Uh, um, uh, and that the, raising the participation age you know, means that you have to stay in education or or a, or employment with an educational qualification until you're 18. That we, we know, there are a number of other rights from the right to buy alcohol, which used to be 16, uh, uh, alcohol for instance, uh, tobacco, which used to be 16, which is now 18, fireworks, having a tattoo, uh, um, visiting a tanning booth. Parliament has legislated in recent years that all of those rights have to be set, protected at 18. Uh, and all, all of those rights 
um, are going in one direction. We now basically have an established age of adulthood, which is 18, uh, and it seems, it seems odd to be moving to 16. We can talk about turnout if you like. I'm unconvinced by any turnout arguments, but I think that's kind of, actually, that is a bit of a, a side check. Um, are you convinced that 18 is the right age voting age? Would you like to raise it? No, no. I, I, and that's part of the reason why I'm against votes at 16. I, because, I, 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 because I think once, uh, once, a, once a set of people are enfranchised, it's really difficult to undo that. Right? And part of the reason why politicians find it hard to argue against votes at 16 is they, because they stand in front of really engaged young people and say, well, we, you know, we, we're not interested in your votes. Um, no, I, I, I think 18 is the recognised age. Um, I think there are some unfortunate, there are some uh, uh, unfortunate consequences of 18. So there's, there's an academic called Mark Franklin who basically says 18 is the worst possible age. Uh, and actually, if you lowered the voting age to 16, you would capture more young people while they were at school and uh, in uh, school and in the family, and therefore it might be, they might vote in greater numbers than, than an 18. Didn't happen in the Isle of Man, but even but if we do accept that point, um, um, I think that theoretically that's a flawed argument because that argument is that let's get 16 and 17 year olds because they're not independent rather than because they are, uh, and that that, stri that strikes me as a, a as a bit of an odd argument. Thank you. And why do you think that enfranchising 16 and 17 year olds would put their rights at risk? Wouldn't it enhance their rights? Uh, well, there are, there are protected rights of vulnerable young people that I think it, it becomes really hard to argue that there that should be special provision for, for, for protecting 16 and 17 year olds. So I've already mentioned what happens to homeless uh, young people. Now, now usually homeless, homeless people under 18 are, are, are put into children's homes, usually, right? Uh, um, but it's hard, to, it's hard to, pr to keep that right protected, or if you are, protecting that right, you have to have special provision. And I think you're going to have to constantly say, well, there are special provisions. Constantly say there are special provisions that for, for here, is a, here is an age group that we don't think can be trusted to know, to, to, to be trusted to know whether to get a tattoo or not. We don't think can be trusted to know uh, whether to buy fireworks. We don't, we, we don't think can be trusted um, to make their own decisions about going to a tanning booth. And yet we are going to say that, 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 that they are, uh, are going to have full citizens' rights in, in the voting. Then if you say full citizens' rights in voting, there are obvious parallels. And the one that we discussed for the actual commission for the, for the project was, uh, was the uh, uh, jury service. We, see that as, uh, we, we then saw that as a fairly similar civic duty to voting. Uh, um, it, it's, about weighing up, it's about weighing up of a case, it's about uh, a passing judgment that's likely to affect your peers and the people around you in society, it's about making a decision. Uh, and uh, you know, if, if you don't want 16 year olds on a jury, then why would you want them to vote? 16 year olds, there are plenty of evidence, you've seen some fantastically engaged young, uh, uh, young people, they are a credit to this country. Most of them got in, got, were engaged prior to 16. Very few of them, if they're engaged at 16, won't be engaged at 18. I think that there are, there are rules about engagement, there are activities about getting involved in campaigns, in political parties, about becoming full, full and inclusive members of society and playing an active role in society um, um, that I think uh, do not rely on the, on, on the, on the right to vote. Um, but if, uh, if we are to think that uh, simply that uh, the act of voting early makes you vote often, well, what happens if most of them abstain? And surely abstain abstaining early will also abstain often. It certainly seems to have happened in the Isle of Man. The first time 16-year-olds were given the vote in two more elections in 2006, fewer than one-third of eligible 16, 17-year-olds registered to vote, uh, uh, actually voted. Uh, so sorry, it's fewer than the fifth in 2006, it's fewer than the third in 2011. Um, so you know, it, it, it's uh, you know, so we, we hear lots of we hear lots of optimism about what's happening in Scotland, and I hope that that's right. We hear lo lots of uh, uh, optimism about what's happened in Austria. We hear lots of uh, uh, of wishful thinking about the engagement of young people, but actually, I think the evidence runs in the opposite direction. Thank you. I'll pass over to Austin. Do you think it's a problem that different rights accrue to young people at different ages? And do you believe all rights should accrue at one single age? Uh, there's, never, there's never been a single right of uh, uh, age of majority. So, you know, so criminal responsibility, the, the age of uh, 
uh, the age at which you can give consent for medical for, for medical procedures is very confused. I mean, it's basically 16, but the GM the GMC advice is that you that you would have uh, that you would need parental permission to make sure that the, 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 the 16, 16 year old isn't 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 moving against uh, uh, what the parents want. Um, you can join the army in this country at six uh, 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 at 16 with parental permission. I think it's an important caveat, parental permission. But because we've signed the UN Declaration of the Rights of the Child, you're kept out of active service until you're 18. Um, that, that actually strikes me as a really good argument for raising the age at which you can enlist. It strikes me as a pretty poor argument for lowering the age at which you can vote. So does that answer your, your question? I, I mean, I, th I think where we are now, it's very difficult to have a single age of adulthood. But we're closer to that than we've been at any point in the past 50 years. Thank you. The next question is on Shaquille. Um, okay, so uh, it's kind of like a, one of the reasons people say that um, uh, young people shouldn't be given the vote is because um, they'd be less likely to vote low turnout, which I think you've kind of touched upon. But why do you think that young people are less likely to vote than those in old age groups? specifically over the last 20 years, because we know uh, previously turnout among young people was, was actually quite okay. high. Okay, I, I mean, I think turnout is, is not the central argument here, right? But, if, but, you know, there is a very strong relationship between age and turnout. Uh, and it's just to do with the way that society has changed, just to do with the way that social change has occurred. Um, so we're far less likely to be engaged in the everyday mechanics of politics that tied us to political parties than we were generations ago or two, two or three generations ago. Think about the way we consume politics. Um, people like me, um, I mean, I, w I was a politics geek. People like me, you know, when I love politics from a very early age, I have very early memories of, of uh, general elections uh, uh, from, from 1974. Um, I can consume more politics than I can shake a stick at. I can watch rolling news networks. I can, I can go on vote websi uh, websites like theyworkforyou.com and find out. And be, I can watch the parliamentary channel. I can be better informed about politics than any previous generation. But, I can, but people who aren't like me can avoid politics. They can watch the movie channel and the, 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 the music channel and the sports channel. Uh, and uh, when I was growing up with three TV, with, uh, three TV channels, it was very hard to, you kind of just got some of that politics uh, by osmosis. Um, and nowhere is that gap between the engaged and the disengaged um, wider than in younger people. And so we've seen today, you know, well, you, know, you would have seen from the, from, from the previous uh, um, uh, day of collecting evidence, you've seen some, some fantastic examples of engaged young people some fantastic examples of people who are a credit to this society. They are not typical of their age group. And what's ha what happens with young people is, is that there isn't a normal distribution. There aren't the super engaged, the disengaged, and people in the middle. There is a missing middle. There are the super engaged, the disengaged, and a big gap in the middle. And converting those disengaged into the engaged is a really hard process. And it's something we've got to think about very carefully. Um, we've seen what's happened with citizenship education. The real, the real shame about citizenship education in England is how few students who have actually had it realise they've had it. Right? Uh, and, uh, and now with its relegation from the national curriculum to the, uh, uh, to the basic curriculum, that's only going to get worse. It's, it hasn't, it's struggled to find a place in, the, in an already crowded curriculum, being taught mostly by maths teachers, form teachers, geography teachers who have drawn the short straw. Uh, um, uh, uh, being being quite a, uh, a, a marginal subject in terms of ex examinations. If you look at the original report on the Citizenship Foundation, the Crick report, it was very very clear that it was actually talking about making change over a very long scale. And I think it's sad that it hasn't been given that time to to make a difference. Oh. So you about engagement of young people, and you spoke about it again then. What more do you think needs to be done to engage more people, particularly young people, in politics? I think we need to broaden the uh, agenda of politics. Uh, and I think much work needs to be done about, about showing how uh, politics is actually fairly, is actually fairly complex. 
uh, and uh, I, I know that there's, 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 a, there's a very seductive pattern to say that what we need to do is to make politics more simple. Actually, we don't. We need to explain how complex it is. And one of the complexities, we need to be actually, we need to be very mature about how we present the world of politics. It's quite likely that you will be engaged in an issue, that you will have what you consider to be the better argument, and you will lose. Uh, and too much of an attempt to sell politics to young people, to package politics to young people right now, does so in a very simplistic manner. And from the politicians wearing baseball, baseball caps and trying to be down with the kids, through to the, the idea that you can change the world by, by joining a Facebook group or signing an e-petition. Right? All evidence shows that people who are involved in things like uh, in things like demonstrations and marches, they stay involved, and that's what you've got to do. So you've got to encourage young people to be engaged at an early age, and then keep them involved. And when they and when they're kept involved, voting is something that can come at 18. Uh, um, but uh, uh, but I, I do think we need to work really hard. The danger at the moment is that um, is is that you know. Vote to 16 might happen for the wrong reasons, and once you, I think you, really, you need a really good reason to change, to have a, uh, a change of, uh, of the franchise, and it's really hard to undo. Uh, and I don't think that, 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 that reason exists right now. But to get back to your, to your original question, I think what we, what we need to do is to think very carefully about, about how young people's needs can be addressed within the mainstream system. Stop treating them as so different from the rest of society. Uh, but, but also start to talk to start to talk to them maturely and listen to them. So you also mentioned uh, a little bit earlier uh, about the idea that if you vote early, you vote for life. But if you don't vote early, you then don't vote for life. At a previous, at our last evidence session, um, a, a potential solution to that was suggested as first-time compulsory voting. Um, could could we have your opinion on on that as a potential solution? Um, I think it's an asinine. I, I think it's a crazy idea. I think the idea that you would compel a particular group of voters, uh, a particular group of society, to vote, would send out all the wrong signals. We we are compelling you to do this. Now that would re that really runs the risk of turning the disaffected and the dis uh, disengaged into the into the into the downright resentful. Uh, and I think that you know, I understand why they why why, why the policy there. I think that actually there's quite a there's quite a mature argument to be had in this country about whether we should have compulsory voting. Personally, I you know we, we make we make citizens do an awful lot of things that they don't otherwise want, that they wouldn't otherwise choose to do. We make them pay taxes. We make them serve serve on juries, for instance, um, um, uh, and that's part of a civic duty. I think there's a there's a very Decent arguments to be had there about compulsory voting. I would be very much against making it compulsory for one set of voters only, uh, because I think that sends entirely the wrong signals. Thank you. Thank you. Fridinini has the next question. Um, so you mentioned a number of examples of other countries and crown dependencies um, which have lowered their um, like its voting age in yeah. your evidence. What do you think we can learn from them? Uh, in Argentina, in Honduras, in Brazil, voting is compulsory for those over 18. It's optional for 16s and 17s, which is the, which is the opposite of, of, of the point Philip's just made. Um, Austria seems to be the best example of where 16-year-olds do seem to do 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 seem to be engaged uh, 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 in the voting process in higher numbers than anywhere else. Um, Nevertheless, there's still evidence to suggest that when asked about uh, um, likelihood to respond, that, that you know, 16 to 19 year olds in Austria are still the least likely of all groups to, uh, um, uh, um, um, to say that they are likely to vote in, in, in certain elections, most possibly the European Parliament elections. Um, there's little evidence to suggest there's been a fantastic success from countries that have lowered the voting age. Okay? So in Germany, there were lots of local examples that were that were kind of related to making sure that the SPD stayed in power in some of those uh, in, in some of those municipalities, and it didn't work in most of them. Um, uh, but it hasn't been extended past that. In Denmark, there are there are currently some some some, some local experiments, but there's no talk about there's no talk about extending it to a, a um, to a to, to, to national elections. Um, 
I believe that Estonia right now is talking about whether they should have uh, votes at 16. Um, I did some work for the Commonwealth. I was an observer, and uh, I was an observer in an election in 2009 in Mozambique. In Mozambique, 52 percent of the population is under 30. Right? And what was stunning about Mozambique is that the young people. That you, the, the young people in Mozambique, when they came to give evidence to the Commonwealth Observer Group, said exactly the same things um, that young people in this country say about, you know, about not being listened to by politicians. The difference is that in uh, that that in Mozambique, Mozambique, if the if if the if, if the young voted in Mozambique in large numbers, they would control the government because they've got the voting power. In most other polities, because of the way the age dynamic has gone, uh, 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 younger people are, are likely to be outnumbered by older people who are more likely to vote as well. Um, so I, I think that there is very little uh, uh, evidence from those countries that have experimented with votes of 16 that it's been a resounding success. Uh, um, and we wait and see what happens in Scotland. But what, what do you think we can learn from the countries where Vote 16 has been a success? Well, well um, not, a, not a great deal. Because I think, that be, what, what I would say is that without a wider program of engagement of young people and taking seriously young people's rights, it's really difficult to, really difficult to see what it achieves. Thank you. I'll pass you over to Brandon. In your evidence, you say you'd like to see a wide-ranging discussion of political education. How would you like to see political education changed? Well, at the moment, it doesn't really exist apart from A-level politi uh, uh, politics. Um, um, uh, so, uh, I mean, I think there's a... I mean, it, there is some fantastic work going on in citizenship education, uh, uh, um, um, but if you look at the national curriculum, I mean, as I say, it's been relegated from the national to the basic curriculum now. Look at the national curriculum, it's the size of a phone book. You turn to the bit on citizenship and it's, you know, and it's kind of three or four pages long uh, for, the, for the advice to teachers. There's some fantastic programs going on there. Um, but primarily, primarily uh, uh, um, school teachers are rightfully nervous about talking about politics with a big P. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and I, w I think actually political education ought to be a bit more about the nuts and bolts of you know how did par how did parties come to exist you know who are they you know who do they think of as their core constituencies who are they trying to trying to represent what's the what's the point of that let's talk about the the struggle for female suffrage for working class suffrage let's talk about these historical uh, uh, struggles let's talk about representation uh, and uh, uh, democratic rights in other countries. Uh, I would, I would like to see citizenship education be more explicitly political, um, but for that it needs, uh, it, it needs a um, um, significant uh, endorsement from, a, um, from the higher ups. Do you think it should be compulsory then, citizenship education? Well, as I say, I mean, it is compulsory. It has been in compulsory in England now for nearly, for nearly a decade, and, the, and the, the saddest thing is how few people how few young people who have had it realise they've had it because it's been in it's been in core group or form group or it's been you know it's been folded up into PSHE or you know it's been delivered in a way that's not you know for very understandable reasons and not by specialist teachers in in a non-assessed way in you know in special activity days and all of all of that sort of stuff it's it's not being delivered in a way that was originally designed. Uh, um, uh, I would personally like to see it compulsory. I would like to see political education being compulsory. But, but there's a fundamental educational reform question there of how you get it into an already crowded curriculum. And I think you, you, we've got to be realistic and sympathetic. Would you be in favour of politics being taught as a separate subject and citizenship being the other? As a, as a politics professor, yes. Um, but, uh, uh, but again, you know, we've got to be sensitive. I mean, if you look at what's the, the proposals for the, for the changes in the post-16 uh, environment now uh, are talking about a much broader uh, range of subjects uh, post-16 uh, and the essentialization of, uh, uh, of subjects like maths and sciences. Uh, I think that a discussion about the broadening of that might, might include social sciences and humanities and certainly we should, we should, ought to include politics, yes. The final question which we are putting to all the uh, witnesses is if you were writing a report on votes at 16 to the government, which recommendations would you include? Um, well, I already have, uh, uh, <laughs> I suppose, when I, was, when I was on the Electoral Commission. Um, I think you need, you need a really good reason for essentialising 16. 
I think may, many of the arguments about engaged young people could equally apply to 14-year-olds or to 12-year-olds uh, or to 23-year-olds. Or to 20, we have the direction of travel is towards embedding 18 as the age of national adulthood. Uh, and I think you need a really good reason for, 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 to, to, to convince me that 16 is the, is the new essential age. At a time when we're no longer letting uh, uh, young people leave school to live independent lives. At a time, where, so, you know, at 16 you can, you can leave home at 16, but you can't sign a tenancy agreement until you're 18, so you're still dependent on an adult. Uh, a time when the direction is moving the other way, you need a really good reason to change. And I've never met an engaged 16-year-old who wouldn't be an engaged 18-year-old. Well, once again, I'd like to thank you for attending today's session and all the evidence you've provided will be used for a report. Thank you thank very, much. very much. Thank you. Hello, I'd like to welcome you to the British Youth Council's Youth Select Committee on Votes at 16. Apologies for running behind schedule. I would like to remind everyone that you can uh, engage with the debate on Twitter using the hashtag Youth Select. Please can you introduce yourselves, beginning with Alex. I'm Alex Robertson, the Director of Communications at the Electoral Commission. I'm Tom Hawthorne, Head of Electoral Policy at the Electoral Commission. Thank you. I'll go over to Joe with her first question. Good afternoon. In your 2004 paper, The Age of Electoral Majority, you said there would be a marginal increase in the running costs of the registration process and some of the initial implementation costs. If the voting age was lowered, has the Electoral Commission made any recent estimate of what the costs would be? Do you want to take that one, Alex? Um, from a, from a, a practical administrative um, perspective, we haven't made any recent um, revised estimate of, of those costs. I think the kinds of costs um, that uh, would likely be increased would be um, in terms of the effort that electoral registration officers have to do to contact a larger number of people. If you, if you want to have um, uh, lower the, the registration age, the voting age, you'll have more people on the register, so it's, it's more people for registration officers to contact. And that's not a bad thing, it's just um, something that increases the, the workload there. Um, I, there would also need to be some additional um, work on raising public awareness, making sure that people understood, people aged between 16 and 18 understood what they needed to do differently. I don't know if Alex might want to talk a little bit about that. I mean, one thing that's definitely worth mentioning, I, I guess you'll, uh, you'll probably have questions on anyway, is um, the um, voting age of the referendum in Scotland has been lowered to 16 already, and we have some experience of, of that. Um, last autumn, electoral registration officers contacted people who were between 15 and 17 and therefore would be um, eligible to vote and otherwise wouldn't be um, at the Scottish referendum. And what they did was identify who was in there um, from local authority records, um, who they thought was met the age requirements for the referendum and, and sent information out to them. What we also did ourselves um, across Scotland is run advertising specifically aimed at 16-year-olds. And one of the things that we found from doing that um, Scotland is perhaps a little bit of a one-off in that the general awareness amongst the general public and actually also amongst young people is very high. So a lot of young people already knew that you could vote if you were 16, but actually before we ran the campaign, not many knew that you had to be registered to vote and had to take um, that active choice. So we ran advertising on radio uh, that we thought um, young people would listen to and also um, Facebook and other online activity to, to specifically target them and that, that seems to have been broadly successful. But as Tom says, some of these things would, would cost a little bit of extra money. Um, there are other changes that are happening to electoral registration, including um, for the first time being able to register online in England and Wales. Um, that just happened earlier, uh, sorry, last month, and in Scotland it will be from September. So um, th there's also some positive stuff there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dio has the next question. 
The government suggested in its written evidence to us that there might be a need to take extra steps to protect the personal data of 16 and 17 year olds if they're included on the electoral register. How practical would this be? Um, that's a good question. I think there is, there's already some information about 16 and 17 year olds that will be published on electoral registers. So um, uh, 16 and 17 year olds can be added to the electoral register at the moment. They're called attainers. So if you're going to become 18 and eligible to vote during uh, the period that the register is in force, then it's important that your names are already on that register so that if you turn 18 on polling day, for example, you don't have to go through another registration process. But I think if um, the uh, voting age is reduced to 16, it mean you may have um, details about 14 or 15 year olds on, on the electoral register, and that's a, a we think, we agree with the government, um, a different um, uh, data protection and security question that need to be addressed differently. Um, and I know that in Scotland uh, already they've taken some steps to, to work out how to do that. But of course it's important to balance off um, the need for campaigners to know who those voters are likely to be because there's no point being on the electoral register if campaigners can't come and try and persuade you of the benefits of their arguments. So there is a difficult balance to strike. I don't think it's an impossible balance to strike. It's not, um, it's not um, something that can't be done. Um, and I think obviously, I'll probably refer back to the previous question as well, um, we'll be looking at the experience of the Scottish referendum um, later on this year and there will be a huge amount that we can learn about the practical implications, the costs, as well as how difficult it was to address some of those questions. Okay. I would just add a piece. Okay. So you kind of touched on this already, um, but given that that individual electoral registration requires national insurance number, how would you register attainers if the voting age was lower to 16? And more importantly, how is it done in Scotland and how can we kind of into practice here. So I start on that yeah, time. So, so in Scotland, the registration process hasn't changed yet. So you don't need to provide your national insurance number in Scotland for, for the referendum. Um, and it will only change um, after the Scottish referendum, and obviously the voting age have, remains at 18 for, for elections. The referendum was just a, a one-off. Um, so the, the system that's been introduced in England and Wales now that requires your date of birth a national insurance number when you register and you can, can do that online, which, which we think is a, is a great thing. Um, obviously, if it were to be lowered, then the information that's provided would need to be, would need to be thought about. Um, and that would be one of, I think, a number of considerations that Tom mentioned at the beginning that would need to be thought through very carefully um, where that change would be made. Tom, I don't even want to... Yeah, I think probably just more widely, I think um, a lot of people probably talk about the costs and the difficulties involved in lowering the voting age. but. Um, there would also be some good opportunities for improving the process and improving engagement, improving registration rates. So actually, if you are lowering the voting age to 16, it's much more likely that you'll have um, groups of, uh, of people who are eligible to register at that age in schools rather than at 18, lots of people won't be in school. So you've got uh, perhaps a more, for registration officers, an opportunity to do more focused work specifically in schools. And the other point I think is that um, you know, everybody gets issued with a national insurance number when they turn 16, so there ought to be opportunities to streamline that process so that as part of that process there's information that helps registration officers say, well you, I know that you've been issued with a national insurance number, I'd like to um, invite you to register to vote as well at the same time. So I think there are lots of opportunities to help improve registration as well as the costs that you'd, you'd have to look at. Louis. If the voting age was changed to 16, what practical steps, in addition to those already mentioned, would you need to take um, in response to that change? I mean, I mean, I mean, a lot of it, I think, I think, I think we've covered in terms of. Um, I mean, on a practical level, you've got to get the law right. You've got to make sure that um, the uh, it works with the current system. Um, that the uh, it's clear what identification you would need at the point that you register. Um, that there's the right duties on electoral registration officers to target um, uh, the people who would, who would then be eligible at that point. One thing we haven't talked about um, is ex explaining how to vote. Uh, and actually, and this is obviously true for anyone who votes for the first time, and you'd be bringing in a whole new pool of people of you um, um, at, the, at the voting age of 16. But um, we um, tested, uh, in, in Scotland for the referendum, we're producing an information booklet, which you'd all be very welcome to see. It's actually on our website at the moment. Uh, um, we're just finishing off the, the front and back cover before we... Um, send it to, to every household in Scotland. Um, and we tested that material with young people as well as uh, 16, 17 year olds, as well as 
as others. And actually, it's, it's interesting when you when you when you haven't voted before. Some some people in Scotland thought that you would actually have to explain your argument. So rather than just ticking yet, crossing yes or no in, in the box, you would have to justify um, what you did. We've worked with. Um, we think a great organisation called Young Scott, um, very Scott on, uh, Scottish on the, on the committee, Young Scott who are responsible for issuing um, travel passes in Scotland for everyone I think up to the age of 25. Um, so a lot of people um, are familiar with them and go to their website and you know, they've got a lot, of, a lot of interaction going on with young people. We've worked with them to produce um, an online uh, kind of walkthrough about what's involved in voting from getting your polling card through to going to polling station to what happens in the polling station and that's to try and break down some of the barriers for people who might think it's actually a bit harder than it, than it is and it, it's once you've obviously done it once you you know but before then uh, it may, may, may appear more than, than, is, than is reality. I think I'll just <coughs> add to that I think um, it would be wrong to sort of underestimate probably some of the challenges about making sure that people really are aware of what they need to do and getting them registered. So um, we already know from research that we've carried out that um, uh, sort of the, the younger you are, the less likely you are to be registered to vote. Um, and that also sort of correlates with um, people who are more likely to move, move around more frequently. And we know that young people tend to move house more frequently than perhaps people my age or um, older. So there are, there are challenges about making sure that as well as having the, the right to vote, you actually, as, as Alex said, you understand what you need to do, but you understand how to get registered and you're encouraged to get registered. Um, and we wouldn't want to, um, I guess, underestimate the challenge of, 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 of what it would take to do that so that actually it's a meaningful change in the legislation as well. Thank you. Vote 16. Um, uh, what are the reasons for declining levels of voter registration and turnout? <laughs> well, again, great, great question. It's very, very... So I'll try and deal with registration first, and then perhaps Alex might talk about turnout. Um, so I mentioned the research that, we, that we've carried out. We've done a number of studies over the last um, five or six years trying to pin down a bit more precisely um, how many people aren't registered, um, who they are, and try and understand a bit about why they are, because that's the information that we would then need to be able to um, work on public awareness activities, work on um, things that electoral registration officers can do to target those people. Um, so what we know is that, um, <coughs> uh, as I said, younger people are much less likely to register to vote. Um, people from some um, black and minority ethnic communities are much less likely to register to vote. Um, people who move house are much less likely to register to vote. So those are all things that are important to, to factor into that process. We have seen, I think, um, some fairly sustained drops in levels of um, eligible people who are actually registered to vote, um, and that's gone down. Um, there was a more dramatic decline in the mid-2000s. It's sort of starting to stay, sort of level out a bit now, um, but that's, that's something that needs um, to, to continue to be looked at and a, a, lot, a lot more work, sort of making sure that people do understand what they need to do. But um, I think the other thing probably is just a, a bit of a relationship with declining turnout mm -hmm. and declining levels of interest mm -hmm. in politics among the population generally. I think probably those of us in the room today are not, probably not uh, uh, have a normal level of interest in politics. We've got a heightened level of interest. Most other people don't um, have quite such an interest in politics. And I think also some of the trends, the wider trends of trust um, uh, and participation in elections. I mean, I mean on, on turn that more, more broadly, I mean, there's, there's a lot of um, evidence out there, a lot of academic research about this, not just in the UK, but internationally. And we're not alone in having declining turnout here. It's a problem that affects most Western democracies. Um, and there are lots of different reasons for that. Um, and one of the things that I think is quite interesting when you look at some of the research is that it, isn't just, it doesn't appear just to be an age effect. So although you get lower turnout amongst the younger end of the electorate, what seems to be happening, and I, I, I don't think this is particular to the UK, um, is that, 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 that you can, if you don't get the voting habit, so if you don't vote when you're young, then you tend not to vote when you become, you move into your late 20s, your 30s, and so on. Um, and, and that's actually much more worrying, that it wouldn't, that, the, that might, something that might feel and currently be described as an issue to do with turnout towards the um, um, younger ages actually actually starts to, to feed through into to older um, into the older parts of the population. Yeah. 
Do you think any part of the reason is because it's just less con um, less convenient for young people to vote? I think the the convenience of voting is is um, it's it's something that people do tell us affects whether they they do or don't vote. So we do. Um, research with people after every election and we ask them whether they voted or not and if they didn't vote why they didn't vote and quite often that's about uh, not knowing that the election was taking place not knowing what the candidates stood for you know not you know not having a good enough um, understanding of, of what the parties wanted to get across but people do say that they didn't find going to a polling station um, particularly convenient I think there is going to be a big challenge for the election system as we continue to move into new ways of communicating and we know that um, there is a growing expectation among all of us here that we'll, we'll do things online for example, we'll bank online, we'll um, uh, shop online, we'll buy tickets, we'll make appointments for things online and so not doing that voting process online is going to become a more obvious anomaly. Having said that, I think that the um, security and secrecy challenges of getting an online voting system are really, really significant. Um, and I'd caution against um, drawing too much of an analogy with banking, for example, where actually banks build in a, a fraud um, margin. They accept that there'll be some fraud in their system. They'll be able to trace some of that, recover some of that. Um, but that's not something that I think we, we would all be prepared to accept in a voting system. So. Um, there are some there are some significant technical challenges. I'd also say I think that some of the um, countries, Estonia for example and Norway, who have developed and, and put in place um, online voting systems, are actually starting to draw back from that because um, of security concerns that they've identified after the process. Yeah, I mean, do you think like focusing on young people and going back to convenience again? There's a lot of things that young people like at 18 that they're doing at the moment, like such as moving house or and uh, going to uni or thing. Do you think that deters them from voting? That's a reason why turnout is so low? The practical aspects of life at that age? Um, I think that, I, I'm not sure that we've got any sort of concrete um, sort of research evidence uh, to, to, to go behind that, but I think you could certainly see that actually for some people, they've got busy, complicated lives already, then um, you know, remembering to fit in voting for people who aren't maybe quite as engaged is, is going to be a bit of a challenge. Yeah. I, I mean, when, when, we, when we talk about um, why people aren't registered to vote, and the same would be true, although the effects would be different for, for not voting, we talk about situational factors and attitudinal factors. And for young people, and just in terms of registering to vote, um, there are a lot of situations, like, just like you mentioned, that you move house a lot more. I mean, the, if you've moved house in the last year, Tom might correct me if I get this wrong, but I think there's only a 27% chance that you'll be on the electoral register accurately. That, I mean, that is much, much lower than the rest of the population. That is a huge determinant in terms of why people aren't, aren't registered. And if you're younger, that's obviously more likely to happen. Um, situational factors in terms of not voting, I mean, not knowing that there was an election, that would be a situation, you know, just things that relate to or not being around when it's been talked about. I don't, and I suppose you're getting into some of the practicalities there, but to the extent that there are... It, I think Tom's right, and, and we've thought a little bit about sort of 10 years from now, it will stick out a bit more that you're, you're, not, you're not voting online. But is it really going to be those situational factors that are the, the source of disengagement, or is it much more likely to be those it's attitudinal factors, things like... Um, and the, we, we, I, I should say, because we focus so much on registration rather than um, thinking that it's our job to, to get... that we'll make a huge difference ourselves uh, um, getting people to vote. Um, the research comes from other places, and I'm sure you, you, you and others will have seen it. Um, but uh, people feeling like politics isn't for them, people being disconnected from politicians, um, whether or not uh, they feel that the policies that are offered by political parties and candidates speak to them, I suspect um, are, are more likely to be underneath some of the disengagement than things that I suppose I've, I've just described as situational. Thank you. Thank you. Could, in your opinion, could electoral registration officers? do more to increase registration among young people and could you give some examples of times when these registration officers have done a good job of getting young people registered? Yeah, I think um, probably for most <coughs> registration officers the work of um, contacting um, younger people and, and um, 
uh, getting them registered is going to be part of their overall strategy. You know, they've got to, to cover um, all of the people resident in their area um, from 16, 17 year olds upwards to, to uh, much older. Um, I think that there is probably fair to say there's some really good practice out there and there are some areas that aren't doing as much and I don't think that is about a lack of will, I think it's probably partly a lack of um, resource but also partly a lack of understanding about what works and what's an effective way to encourage younger people to, to register to vote. So some of the things that we'll be trying to do with registration officers is provide them with examples of good practice, what works, how best to do that. Working, I think Alex might talk about working with some um, uh, other organisations and helping registration officers work with other organisations to, to encourage that. Um, one of the areas that um, we've seen some really good practice is from Northern Ireland where the Chief Electoral Officer um, has done a couple of things. He's developed a schools initiative where he has um, worked with schools, um, uh, post-primary schools in Northern Ireland to um, get some information about pupils at those schools so that him, he and his team can send out for, uh, have forms that are already pre-populated with name and address. They can take those to the schools. They organize, the schools organise a dedicated session where the registration officer um, talks through um, you know, some of the arguments about why it's a good idea to register to vote, talks about what they need to do to finish this registration process um, and helps them with any practical queries while they're filling in the forms there and then. So in that sort of concentrated hour um, session, you've maybe managed to register 100, 100 or so um, younger people. And that, there's really good evidence that that um, direct face-to-face -face approach is much more effective for younger people than, you know, for example, just sending a letter in the post that you know, uh, maybe um, you, you, know, you won't open for a, a week or so or just gets lost in amongst everything else. It's, it's about being there on the spot, face-to-face, -face, um, with the encouragement and the help. You know, there's questions that you're going to have. It's much nicer to, have to, you know, to be able to ask someone who's right there with you than have to you know, try and find it online or phone somebody, somebody up to do that. Um, I think the other thing in Northern Ireland that's not directly relevant to, to the rest of the UK is that um, over in Northern Ireland uh, it's possible to apply for an electoral identity card. Um, so that's something that proves who you are when you go to vote. That's not something that's here in the UK, in um, Great Britain yet. But actually they find that that's quite a good incentive to encourage people to register to vote because it's proof of um, identity and proof of age that can be used to prove that you're 18 um, if, if you need to do that as well. Alex, if you want to talk about some of the partnerships as well. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, I was going to mention all that, 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 that's a great example. I mean, local authorities have a huge amount of interaction with young people through loads of different routes, and it is about taking advantage of that, getting into schools, youth services, stuff where there is already face-to-face -face contact with young people happening, um, getting on, on the back of that. Um, and th uh, thinking also, I mean, this, and this is true of public engagement generally, try and go where people already are. So that's why we think, in, in terms of what we're doing in Scotland, going to working with an organisation like Young Scott, where a lot of people are in, in contact with them anyway, rather than trying to drag them somewhere else and say, let's talk about electoral registration. Well, no thanks very much. That's not totally interesting. You have to go um, if people are already in a classroom or they're already um, uh, uh, part of a youth service, then, th then go there and, and get an interesting, engaging, face-to-face -face session. And if you aren't, if you're an electoral registration officer um, or some of the electoral services team, and some of them will be great at this, personally great at this, others will not, others will not be terribly good at going into a room full of young people and getting them engaged in politics, and at the end of it saying, now register. But actually working with other organisations, I'm sure you've heard or seen some of what they do, organisations like Bite the Ballot, who, write, who run very engaging sessions with young people, and then at the end of it are able to say, look, here's a form, fill it in. You know, you said, you, you were just in a session where you were talking about things you wouldn't thought you, you were talking about, and you had strong views about them. That was politics, and to vote in elections, you need to be registered. Now go and do it. And actually, with online registration, it does just open up so many opportunities. Rather than filling in a paper form, having to make sure you've got the right name and address of the electoral registration officer, processing it at the back end, you can do it right there and then. So is the Electoral Commission exploring new ways, uh, sorry, is supporting new technology um, to support voting and uh, registration? Um, would you totally rule out supporting online voting? I'm excited to have a little bit about registration. Yep. Um, and we've talked a little bit about registration already. But uh, in terms of online, um, I mean, it's just such an opportunity, the, um, the being able to now register to vote um, online in England and Wales. And um, 
we've been making um, a really big effort to push that online message, um, both through the advertising that we are running to get people um, registered to vote, and also in the guidance and the resources and the materials that we give to electoral registration officers. So rather than just saying, here are a range of options that you can register to vote in all these different ways, you can still, you can still register to vote in, in paper form, uh, really pushing the online option. Um, it just makes it so much quicker and more convenient for people and making sure people understand that before they choose to fill in a paper form instead, um, we think is really important. There are also um, a lot of organisations that... Um, uh, that are already engaged in, I've just, I mentioned one earlier, by the ballot, but there's tons more that are already engaged in um, working with young people on these sorts of issues, but also going to um, businesses who, um, mobile phone providers, um, uh, uh, I mean, just lots of different organisations who people are already in touch with online, and at the end of a transaction or at the end of, when you, when you move utility company from one to another, uh, when you move house, um, uh, popping up a little box saying, "Have you? You've, it sounds like you've just moved house. Are you registered at your new address?" And then and then do it all online. At the moment, it it, it is just so. It, 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 I mean, of all the interactions you have in your day-to-day -day life, where you just expect to be able to do it online, to it, even even if you got interested enough to go and and to go to actually, it's our, our website where you would download a paper form to find that then when you get there, you have to download it, print it out, put a stamp on it. I mean, that will put a lot of people off. Um, so we think there are tremendous opportunities from uh, online registration. I think we're only at the beginning of that. What we've got now, I think, is a, a good, secure, very easy to use system. I'd, I'd really encourage people to have a look at it if you, if you haven't already. The question there is when you take that. How, how do you make that online system more accessible to campaigners? Um, campaigners are very used to, uh, in their campaigns, integrating online actions. How do you how do you make the most out of um, what's, what's there so that, that becomes um, second nature? So we think that's very much opened up. In terms of voting, I mean, we, we talked about that, that quite a bit. I'm not sure there's, is there anything you want to add to one? I think, you, I think your, your question was whether we would rule out um, uh, online voting for, for the future. And I think that the, the <coughs> simple, straightforward answer is no, we wouldn't rule it out um, because it's a, part, it's, it's a technology <coughs> that is part of our lives uh, now. Um, and it's a technology that is, is likely only to increase um, for the future. So I think we wouldn't want to rule it out, but I think we also would want to be realistic about the likely prospect that we'll have a system that is um, secure and um, transparent enough um, in the foreseeable future. We did um, work with the government to do some pilot schemes of online voting um, about eight to ten years ago. And there were some useful results from that. Um, you know, some people did use those systems um, to to, register, to to cast their vote in local elections, and they found it really convenient. They thought it was it was a you know big improvement on um, what was there before. But quite often, there were people who would have voted anyway. So it wasn't, um, in a sense, that new technology that encouraged them and brought them into into the voting uh, voting process. But for pilot schemes, they were quite limited in size and. By their nature, they were very, very expensive. Um, so, um, you know, at the moment, uh, across government, there's a lot of pressure on budgets. It's unlikely to be um, a lot of support for making a big, expensive change to the voting system if we can't find other ways to save money elsewhere. So, there are likely to be some cost trade offs in doing that. And I think I talked through some of the security and secrecy challenges um, earlier on. What we would be most concerned about is doing something that undermined the existing fairly high level of trust in, in the voting process. People trust the voting process at the moment, um, and we wouldn't want to do something without thinking about what impact it might have on that level of trust. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 we're going to have to be quick with this one, so please keep your answers brief. But, um, do you not think that online voting takes away some credib credibility and seriousness to the democratic process of voting? particularly for young people, so they won't treat it as, as a serious action if it's... Um, I'll try and answer that fairly quickly. I don't think that we've got any evidence that, that proves or disproves that suggestion. I think there is a, a counter-argument to, to that argument, which is actually for some people going to the polling station, for example, when they see the ballot paper, that's the first time they've heard of any of the candidates. Um, there's a good argument, I think, that says that if you're voting um, online, then actually you've probably got much easier access to a lot more detailed information about the candidates, about what they stand for, what their arguments are. I'm not saying, I don't think we've got any concrete evidence that proves or disproves either of those, those arguments, but there are 
there is another yeah. side to it. But, but, I, mean, I, mean, there, there is, I mean, you've raised a really good point, because there, there is something, this will be a very, very big change to the way we conduct elections in the UK. And how you did it, not, not just um, operationally, all the things we've been talking about, but why we were doing it and why that was explained to be it and how that was part of the democratic debate. If online voting was to make it convenient so more people voted and that was going to be the kind of panacea to the perceived problem or uh, the extent to which people think the reality will differ, but to solve public disengagement you can vote online. I, th I can see that how that wouldn't be terribly helpful. Um, so there is something about how this is introduced, not, not just practically, but how it's introduced and perceived by, uh, by the public generally, not, not just young people. Chuck? So you've <coughs> talked about budgets, but if you had unlimited resources, what would you do to increase voter registration and turnout? <laughs> uh, just, we're just thinking about the prospect of unlimited resources. <laughs> it's never been <laughs> contemplated before. <laughs> Um, I mean, you can, you can always, I guess you can always do, sorry, public awareness, I, I'm responsible for running public awareness campaigns, and we look very carefully when we run public, public awareness campaigns, we use um, something called econometric modelling, um, which is um, uh, a form of statistical analysis where you try and isolate the different impact of things going on at the same time. So, um, looking at the impact of different media we buy, when we buy it, and how that affects what we're trying to get people to do, which is to register online. Um, now, we do that, at some point that diminishes, so you spend more money at some point, you just don't get anyone, anyone doing any more, and we tend, obviously we don't spend beyond that. Um, having said that, more money you can, you can always find new ways of squeezing a bit more out, um, so you could potentially run um, more public awareness campaigns. Um, but you do, we do run public awareness campaigns at the point where people are likely to be most engaged and most likely to take action in the, in the period in the run to election, trying to do it outside that period, I think would have it, it's a different sort of thing to do. I, I think you, a lot more money, I'm not sure, would help. It would be about doing stuff in schools and the ground and communities, not where chucking a load of money out would necessarily help. Um, but I, I just, to be, honest, to be offered an unlimited <laughs> amount of money, uh, it, I mean, that's fantastic. I, I would be able to think about it. I, I probably would just say, in terms of voter registration, I think the area um, where we could see there would be um, you know, potential to get some real benefits was if we were perhaps able to, and this is, this is something that is obviously going to be for the future and it's something that is a theme across government, it's how um, as a public service um, it's possible to make better use yeah. of all of the data that you know, the state has about people already to make it less, you know, less of a burden, less of a, you know, a responsibility on individuals to um, you know, update their registration details. You know, you've got, if you're over the age of 18, you're a British or Commonwealth citizen or a European citizen, um, you've got the right to vote. It shouldn't have to be a complicated or burdensome process for you to um, establish that right to vote. You're just getting on a, uh, your name on a list. So I think there's, there's more that we could get from making better use of that data. But again, that's something that goes across government and mm. is, is all about making sure that different government departments are happy to talk to one another. Um, and that um, always tends to be a lot more complicated than any of us ever expect. Mm. Thank you. Shreen Aini. So um, the Electoral Commission published a report on voter engagement and young people in 2002. Um, has the Commission done any further research since then on the topic? Um, we haven't done a, as much um, further research on engagement um, among young people. As I said, we do some research every year after elections um, to look at um, some of the more practical aspects of um, participation in elections and, like I said, why people say they do and don't um, participate in elections. Um, I think um, one of our changes in emphasis after we finished publishing that report was to say well we think there are good arguments um, on both sides um, there was um, I think a majority in terms of organizations and individuals that talked to us and said to us um, as part of that review that they thought that the voting age should be lowered but actually among all people um, when you ask them in public opinion research they thought that 18 was probably about about the right level so after we'd done that research um, our recommendation was that probably what needed to be done was to see how um, citizenship education developed, whether that was going to have an impact on what people thought about the right level of, of, vote, um, of the voting age should be. Um, and we suggested that that should come back um, and government should look again at that um, 
uh, in sort of seven or eight years' time after that that review. Um, we haven't done our done research ourselves. I think um, our focus shifted somewhat from those kind of questions about um, uh, whether the voting age should be reduced. We think that that's really more of a question for Parliament to, to decide and probably our focus as the Electoral Commission now is on understanding the practical challenges and making sure that Parliament un you know, has a good analysis of the practical challenges involved. Oh yeah, should, should we move to Alex? Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, yes. So, <laughs> so I mean, that, that exact sort of question came up in the when the Scottish Government uh, did their consultation on the Scottish referendum, obviously their proposal, and I mean it's, it's the legislation that's happening, it was for 16 year olds to be able to vote. And we had to ask ourselves, did we have a view on this again? Um, and actually, as Tom said, our, our focus had shifted um, from, from 2002. And we, we see, have seen, I think, since around uh, the middle part of the last decade, as um, it, it very, those, the question about who votes, not, not just the age, but who, who, who votes in every sense, um, is, a, is a fundamental constitutional question where that, that's an issue that Parliament should take a view on. Um, and, but our, our view um, in relation to the Scottish referendum that would apply um, um, were it to be introduced elsewhere is that once, once Parliament set the franchise, um, we want to be absolutely sure that everyone on that franchise has an equal chance of getting registered and then being able to vote. So we um, thought through and worked uh, closely with um, electoral registration officers, the Scottish Government, Scottish Parliament as legislation went through the Scottish Parliament to make sure that there were the right provisions in there. Um, and then I uh, thought about also what uh, we ourselves could do to, to raise awareness amongst young people. Once you've got a franchise, you have to make sure that everyone on that franchise can vote. Thank you. Orson, please. What do you expect the effect of individual electoral registration to be on the registration levels of young voters? And if you could keep your answers brief, that would be appreciated. It's a good question. I think. Um, I think, as Alex mentioned, the, the changes that have come alongside individual electoral registration, um, online registration, should help make it easier for people to register to vote, and that should apply as much to, to younger people as it, as it would um, to, to anybody else. Um, probably, I think, difficult for us to make any definitive predictions, but one of the things that we are doing, and it's worth, um, we'll, we'll try and make sure that the, the committee is kept up to date with the, the findings, we were doing some research um, throughout the transition to individual registration. So between um, now, we've actually got some research that's going to be published later on this month about levels of registration um, in Great Britain. And we'll carry on doing some monitoring research throughout 2014, 2015 through to December 2016 to look at you know, what has happened, what's the story, you know, um, what has the impact been, um, whether we can look at whether there's an impact on particular groups or um, age groups. So we'll continue to publish that information, that's there so that Parliament can understand the impact of the new system and can understand the impact when they make decisions about changes to the system for the future. Thank you. That's our next question. What proportion of el eligible 16 and 17 year olds have registered to vote to date in Scotland? Do you want to go there? Yeah, if you could. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the um, registers for um, in, Scot uh, in Scotland were published, I think, in early April, where we were able to find that out. Um, the um, estimate that we had then was 92,000 um, 16, 70 year olds were registered to vote, or people who would be 16 or 17, um, at the time of uh, the referendum of the 18th of September. Um, in terms of the rate, I, um, this isn't uh, precise, but I think there are about 120,000 16, 17 year olds in Scotland. And if, that, if those numbers are right, the, reg the registration rates for <coughs> 17 to 24 year olds in um, Great Britain generally is 55%. So that's higher than that. I think one of the things that we'll be able to do with the research that I mentioned earlier on is actually um, uh, through the next <coughs> couple of years, maybe just track um, that, that cohort, that group, and see whether they actually have, we've got an impact on overall registration rates among those groups because of the Scottish referendum effect. Thank you. What role, if any, have schools had in Scotland in getting young people to register? Ah, yeah, so, so, I, so I cover that. Yeah. So we, I mean, there was a lot of a lot of interest when, um, and there still is, um, when the legislation was going through the Scottish Parliament, and what, and how how was engagement with young people going to work in every sense, not just um, getting them registered, but 
political literacy, engagement with politics, engagement, the referendum, how would that work, how would that work in schools? Um, and we um, sat down with um, all the different education authorities in Scotland um, and uh, pulled together what we thought our respective roles were, both us as the Electoral Commission, Electoral Registration Officers who are responsible for getting them registered, um, Education Scotland and the, um, the um, uh, organisation responsible for, for school leaders in Scotland. Um, and uh, they, a lot, a lot of, obviously a lot of political education happens anyway in schools, but what we tried to do and what we gave people resources to do was to, at the end of those, those conversations, and, and it happened in, not just in the, uh, I'm sorry, I've entirely forgotten what the name of the subject is in Scotland, which is all about um, uh, const- um, uh, uh, public public affairs and, and so on. Anyway, um, it happens in a range of different um, uh, settings in school, and we gave them resources to say, well, at the end of these sessions, get pe- get people registered. Here are some resources you can use. That will come back to me, and I will tell you when it does. Modern studies. Modern studies, of course. <laughs> Um, was it difficult to convince 16 and 17 year olds to register? Was it difficult to convince, convince, them? convince them? Yeah. I mean, I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure if we know that yet because I think that kind of, that that process is still ongoing. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, probably what we'll do is reflect on that um, when we look at the experience of the referendum. Um, we we hope to publish a report on the referendum by the end of the year. I think. Um, and we'll cover in that what the process was like, what people's response to that was, um, and we'll certainly be looking at some of the public opinion research. So hopefully that's something that we'll be able to come back to you, back to you on um, towards the end of this year. Thank you. Uh, obviously you can't say whether or not you support votes of 16, but if you were writing your report to government um, regarding votes of 16, are there any recommendations which you would include? I mean, I, I think, I think, I think, I think. Make sure you've covered. You've got the legislation right. You've got the funding right. You've thought about how you, you don't just. Um, and government sometimes can be guilty of this. Um, you don't just. You don't just change the law. You don't just give someone flick a switch and suddenly it all happens. You have to think through the whole thing at the beginning. Um, getting the funding right. Getting the the law right. Making sure that electoral registration officers have got the resources to do it. Making sure that um, if people are registered to vote, uh, sorry, are eligible to vote, they do get registered and they know how to vote and how to participate. So that don't just think you can change the law, change one one bit of law where previously it said 18 and then make it 16, and suddenly everything will happen. Do think it through properly. Otherwise, what you might find is you've got people over 18. Um, participating in elections and everything's fine, they're used to doing that and the law works perfectly well for them. But for people between 16 and 17, it hasn't been thought through properly and there's some gaps, so think it through properly at the beginning. And having said that, I think it's probably <coughs> worth um, uh, recognising and worth pro- the committee thinking about um, reflecting that the government already has some really good experience, both the Scottish government in Scotland in preparation for the referendum, but also the UK government, the Cabinet Office here, in terms of planning for delivering this massive change to individual registration. So they know what the, the practical challenges are likely to be, and they, you know, they should be able to use that experience to, um, to make sure that any implementation <coughs> plan for changing the voting age is really properly resourced and thought through. Well, I, I, well uh, I'd like to thank you both for coming today um, to this session. <clears throat> um, apologies for being behind schedule. Uh, all the evidence that you have provided will be used for report. That's the end of the committee. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much. You Thanks much for having us. Thank you.